Hola amigos, esto es el Agostino Zinga Show, conmigo Agostino Zinga, episodio 362, o 362, ¿ya? Yeah? 362, 362, o 363, I don't know, either way, hopefully you got that Spanish translation right through your earlobes, welcome back, it's me, your boy, your friend, your confidant, the guy you never wanted to meet, your best friend you wish you never had, all those in between, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. As always, follow me on the Instagram, pop it up now. Follow me on social, on Twitter, pop it up now. And of course, if you're watching this through YouTube, make sure you smash that like, hit subscribe down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, leave me a five-star review and share it with your friends. And if you want to support the show for as little as $1 a month, $1 only, $1 to equivalent of like, what, £1.20? The Patreon link is down below, patreon.com forward slash Agostino. That's patreon.com forward slash Agostino. I'm posting all of the shows on there. The full HD version of the audio show is going to be exclusively released on Patreon. So make sure you, you go on there if you want to see the full show before releases anywhere else, such as YouTube or Apple and Spotify or Malaki. Click Patreon down below. Patreon.com forward slash Agostino. Patreon.com. It'll be in the show note description and it'll also be on the tag comments underneath this video. Oh, welcome back, my friends. Welcome back. Welcome back. How are you, are you doing? What's the vibe? Are you okay? Are you feeling well? Great. I'm happy to hear that i'm happy to know that um i am doing pretty fine myself i've got a little bit of coca-cola in this little glass here with some ice cubes that i've now dissolved um coca-cola is one of those drinks that you know you tend not to drink quite often i remember there was a time in my youth when you'd buy when we'd buy actually bottles and bottles of like off-brand coca-cola especially the cola stuff that was extremely sugary and it probably tastes a lot better when it was flat I think normal Coke tastes better when it's actually in a glass bottle and you've got it, you know, it's got the bubbles. But flat cola or the, you know, the, the kind of off-brand cola, the little cola, Audi cola, actually tastes pretty decent um, once it's gone flat. It's actually pretty nice. And it makes for nice lollies as well. We used to make these little lollies where you have these little uh, plastic trays and you put little sticks inside and you pour little fizzy drinks in it and make ice lollies. Like we, used, we had a lot of sugar when I was younger. More so than kids nowadays, I think. I think kids nowadays are probably a little bit more health conscious. Well, some kids are just human. I guess if you're a kid that plays on Twitch every day and your parents think you're going to be the next ninja, they're probably going to be stuffing your face full of donuts and telling you to sit in front of that computer as long as it takes for them to get out of their crappy council flat, innit? Because they're going to pin all their hopes on you. I'd imagine so. But back in the day, we used to eat so much rubbish, so much trash. But I guess we offset it really well because we were just allowed outside until until nightfall, basically. Um that was it. You just go outside. Well, we were the quintessential latch and key kids, which I only find out that term later on in it. But when I was growing up, you were quintessential latch and key. There was no, and even back then too, you have to remember. I think what what the latest console that I got gifted from my parents for Christmas was like the Nintendo sixty four, right? And I think the last console that came out when I was that age was might have been the PS one, especially the, the little the smaller one that was like uh, the size of the CD. That was a really cool. Um, design actually that might have been the latest thing that came out during that time and then obviously there was the playstations what's that the, the handheld playstation the black one the big huge one i remember a few of the boys that used to hang around in the church had had one of those but that was about it and they were things that you played with for a per period of time and then you kind of gave somebody else to kind of play it wasn't i guess because there was no you know what maybe has changed with with the computer games i'm thinking about it now it might be partly or mainly due to the fact that they're competing online because i think even my little brothers who like are on you know they're on bloody they're, they're online all the time talking to their friends via their xbox and ps or whatever they've got um i guess the aspect of being able to connect with randoms online or your friends really changed the game same way how i guess internet became a little bit more accessible when you could access it via your smartphone and your tablet right when the internet was just defined or was just only accessible via a desktop computer and desktop computers back in the day were extremely expensive let alone laptops you remember back in the day when desktop computers were really expensive and laptops were even more expensive because they were portable now it's sort of flipped now desktop pcs are super expensive because i guess they don't make many of them or if they do make them they have to make them to like a really high spec to make it worth it right there's no point in making like an entry-level desktop pc you might as well make something mid to high level so that when people so that people when, when they buy into it they're buying at a higher price point because laptops, you know, Google Chromebook, you could probably get one for like 100 quid, I'm assuming. Um, yeah, but I think the internet changed the computer game um, landscape forever. And now you've got kids, it's, it's really difficult to take them off of it, isn't it? Because by and large, especially if you're a kid that, 
I don't know, like like how I was. I was on the forums all the time. I was a proper internet kid. So I can imagine now if you're a bit of an internet kid and you've got internet. So you're a bit an internet kid and you're into computer games. It's probably perfect for you because you get the chance to make some actual real friends online. You get a chance to play some of your favorite games. Um, and it's a new experience all the time, isn't it? You have that kind of um, community, sort of like group activity sort of thing going on there. Um, you know, most of the games are usually made with online connectivity in mind, right? You think of stuff like Call of Duty, right? It doesn't really work as a solo first person shooter, right? It works because you get to chance to play online with other people. Um, yeah, it's an interesting times, man. Uh, again, I, I have sympathy for everybody, for parents out there, especially who are trying to raise their kids under these circumstances, man. It must be really, really, really difficult. I, I would imagine so anyway. It must be super, super hard. But anyway, here we are, man. Back on the show again. It's me, your boy, Agostino. Another jam-packed show for you to get um, stuck on into. As per usual, if you've got a drink in hand, if you've got something that you want to sip on, something that you want to dance upon, something that you want to pour all over your body, stuff that you want to wash your hands with. I know some of you people are cheap and you don't want to buy hand sanitizer, so you're using copious amounts of shitty vodka to clean your hands with. Whatever you've got, take that, swig that, eat that, munch that, sit in your seat, lean back and enjoy. I've got a jam-packed show for you today with all the necessary topics that you know and love coming from your boy Agostino, so get your stuff and let's dive on deep to today's topics at hand. Number one issue um, or topic to talk about is this crazy incident with Harry Maguire in Greece, Mykonos, um, to be exact. We don't really know the details uh, around it. Some people are saying that his sister got stabbed with some sort of horse tranquilizer. Some people are saying it's ketamine. Some people are saying she got stabbed with a pen, with a pencil, with a straw. Regardless, some sort of altercation happened with um, Harry Maguire's crew and some unknown um, collective of people, whether they're Albanian gangsters or just um, rival fans, we have no idea. It escalates into the point of some sort of physical altercation. They have a fight. Unbeknownst to them, there are some plainclothes police officers in this establishment, obviously trying to keep an eye on things. They get involved. No one's aware that they're plainclothes police officers. They think it's another group of people. The fight escalates and it gets to a point where they're beefing. People are trying to restrain Harry Maguire and he's slabbed and he's a big dude, big slabbed dude um, who would probably, you know, probably, he reminds you of like a footballing version of Stipe Miocic, right? He's got that kind of massive, he's got that kind of, you know when, yeah, he's got that finger. Like some white people are like really small and frail. And some are just huge. There's no middle ground, isn't it? They're just big. And he's got that kind of big Nordic kind of <laughs> King George VIII wearing ass kind of body frame, isn't it? So you can imagine what it must, what, what, how hard it must have been for the police officers in Greece to kind of hold him down. Um, so yeah, they tried to pin him down. It didn't work. Then it got to a point where it escalated and he was trying to bribe somebody. I think that's the one accusation that's sticking so far. I think the assault stuff, I don't know, they're kind of arguing around that and maybe the reason why it happened, but the bribery seems to be an actual issue. Like he was trying to bribe um, the Greek officials or telling them, asking them who I am rhetorically, offering money, you know, doing the standard rich guy thing, what they do when they get in trouble, they think money and their status is going to allow them to kind of slip out of the situation which is you know they probably have a reason they probably have um they probably um have some sort of right to think that because i'm sure they've been in other situations where that's worked or they've heard of stories but usually you know for people that are sane people that are rational people that are just decent if they hear that they're going to be even more incensed they're going to be probably personally offended that you think that you can corrupt them to such just an extent and they're going to make sure that they kind of come down on you like a ton of bricks so it then got to a point where you go in trial one day trial some weird shit he got found guilty and um, now he's trying to appeal the decision. So the thing at hand here is obviously he's Manchester United captain. I don't agree with him being Manchester United captain in the first place. Like I said, um, it's his first season at United. Big money signing, 80 million plus, I think, from Leicester. Um, again, one of the... One, he was a, a, a big signing because we identified our defence as being one of the areas that we needed to improve upon. Um, we didn't really... We had a lot of square pegs and round holes. None of our combinations seemed to make sense. None of our combinations the manager seemed to trust, even though I'm still a big believer that you could have easily got... We could have easily got away with having a partnership of a really fit um, Bailly and Smalling. I think defensive, partner defensive partnerships really um, are crucial 
you need to have somebody that can attack the ball and somebody that can bring the ball out from defence. I think that's basically the 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 makeup of a perfect um, defensive partnership. And I think you look at somebody like Rio Ferdinand and, uh, and Manny Vidic back in the day, they were co perfect complement to each other, right? Vidic was sort of like more in a John Terry sort of mold. And I guess Rio Ferdinand, of course, was, you know, a Rolls Royce of a defender in terms of carrying the ball out. But those two kind of um, personas are needed in a defensive line. And I guess for a longest period of time, Bayer would be injured, um, Smalling would be out of favour, Rojo would be Rojo so it's hard to kind of have people complimenting it and then when somebody like a Lindelof comes in who doesn't really seem to fit any kind of he's not he's like in the middle he's not necessarily aggressive and he's not necessarily good on the ball um, he doesn't do anything that well so it's hard to marry him up with somebody so we had to go and buy some we had to go and buy a commanding centre back and I think unfortunately for Maguire he, he looks the part but I don't think he's as vocal um, and has great organisational skills as he kind of carries on the pitch he's not that great he needs somebody next to him that has that maybe nous or that they can kind of bounce off each other he doesn't necessarily have the ability to kind of you know hold a fort behind at the back line there as well as you'd hope so that anyway who knows that could change it's his first season he could get better but i always thought it was a bit premature get given the camp to armband but i'm also understanding that bench is a business now we're not a football club anymore so i'm pretty sure this had more to do with the fact that he was the england captain um they tried to make him be the new face of england the new john terry um you know it, it made sense for marketing um he's just you know he's a small town boy from sheffield I'm not a small-time boy, but, you know, he's a you know he's, he's a pretty decent dude. It seems like from all accounts from Sheffield, loves his football, loves his family. It made sense for them to kind of give him the captain's armband in that way, shape or form. But I really think the captain's armband was a bad thing and it really, if anything, put more attention on him and people scrutinised him a lot more than they probably should have. And I think in general, his first season has probably been about, about what, a five or a six. He hasn't been that great. But the best thing about him is that he never gets injured, right? He's been one of our kind of consistent performers in the back line, which is probably the thing that kind of benefited us most in terms terms of keeping our good defensive record throughout the season um but it can needs to be said if you're a Manchester captain and you get involved in the passa passa with some people abroad especially greek authorities um you have to get you, you the, the armband has to be stripped from you whether it's temporarily um stripped from him the captaincy or whether it's something that's done permanently it has to be and i think again i think unfortunately we already have our issues my united as i mentioned in the previous video with our lack of transfers our lack of organization we don't need this. We don't need this headache. Um, Social doesn't need this headache. Maguire doesn't need this headache. We as a club don't need this headache. It's just unnecessary. And I think at any other big club, um, Maguire's captaincy would have got revoked or stripped from him for the time being whilst the investigation was concluding. And if it transpired that he the allegations were false and the Greek authorities were kind of making it up in order to kind of extort him or whatever it may be, fair enough, give him back the armband. I've got no problem with that. But I think at the moment, we have to apply the same level of law that we'd have to do with every, every other player. And I think in some cases, like in the NFL, they have this thing where if you're performing really well, I think a lot of people say this. I think I've heard people mention this on the Pat McAfee show, which is a great um, show. Really make it and check it out. Even if you don't watch American football, it's great to kind of get into the weeds of what goes on behind the scenes. But they always say that there's always one rule for you and one rule for the other, right? If you've got a star running back, a star quarterback, a star defensive lineman, he's definitely going to get treated a lot differently to that um from management than you are if you're just some guy that makes up the numbers that's an but they they they're all aware of that because what is understood is that if you're going to be the if you're going to be the Dennis Rodman of your team you need to perform on the pitch that's no there's no kind of if or maybe right so you look at someone like an Antonio Brown when Antonio Brown was performing at a high level and his performances on the football pitch on the football field were out um kind of uh outstripped his nonsense off the pitch clubs are willing to put up with it organization to put up with it the moment it started to kind of get imbalanced they kind of let him go and i think it was just an example in football is similar i think you know if you got ronaldo in your team and he decides to go out on the lash which he doesn't and come back at 4 a.m but he turns to training and he still scores your hatchet the next week you're not going to treat him the same way you are going to treat an academy graduate or some random guy that's making up the squad numbers it's not, not the same and unfortunately for Harry Maguire, he's not performing at the level that would allow him to have the benefit of the doubt or allow him to kind of be treated with any kind of exemption, exception. He shouldn't be because he should be treated like anybody else because we know if he was, if he was, if this was, if this was Jesse Lingard, if this was one matter for even for instance, who, you know, again, people don't really want him at the club anymore because he's getting a bit, you know, long in the tooth. <coughs> 
the one matter thing is really unfortunate because I really do think he he hasn't been utilized well at United. I think he's never really been played in his favorite number ten position. Even even more so now, where you know we have a pretty strong starting eleven. If there are occasions where Bruno Fernandez can't can't play, Mata should be the first person on the team sheet that plays instead of him. Um, instead he gets he gets put on a wing. He gets put as an inverted forward, like just strange positions. He never got played in an actual number ten. I think if you put one Mata right now and you plop him within. Man City, you put Plum within a even Seville, how they play with Ever Benega, one matter will be incredible. So that's I'm really uh, upset with him. But even I think if if Lingard one matter, if God forbid Phil Jones got caught in this sort of nonsense, any other player that's not performing well, let's not even mention a Paul Pogba, right? If they got caught doing exactly the same thing or found guilty doing the same thing, even if there was an appeal that was coming up. People would be losing their mind, losing their mind, losing their mind. So we have to treat him the same way. We have to. And I guess that's the honest thing that's a bit annoying about this is the the bias that happens and the moving of the goalposts. You saw headlines like, oh, he's not that kind of guy and all this sort of stuff. It's like, dude, I'm all right with giving people the benefit of the doubt, but let's do it to everybody. Don't just extend the benefit of doubt to people that you like or the people that you can easily understand or easily pigeonhole or easily car- 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 characterize, characterize, whatever it may be called, right? Because let's, let's be real. Like, I love... I love Grealish, but if, but if Pogba did what Grealish did, right, driving drunk, crashing his car into a sidewalk, walking around with one slipper on, high off his mind or drunk, whatever you may be, like imagine the stick that he would have got. Imagine the insults. Jamie Carragher was allowed to spit at someone's face, a child's face, actually, right, um, and he was allowed to come. You know, people kind of effectively moved on for that situation. Nothing really has transpired from it. Like allow that thing to happen to someone like an Ian Wright, God forbid, right. Um, a Sol Campbell, even like a Paul Ince or people saying to not have any time for now at the moment, right? It's just not, I just don't, that's what I don't like. Uh, let's apply the rule of law to everybody the same way and let's um, make sure we uphold some kind of standard as a club. If there's one thing that we're not, you know, we're not too good on the transfers, we haven't necessarily acting like a top club in terms of how we've been showing our infrastructure, but let's at least in terms of the discipline, and in terms of what's allowed and what's not so allowed as a club captain, as a representative of the football club, let's have one rule, one rule for everybody. It doesn't matter who you are, because if not, the club is going to be in disarray, man, complete disarray. This is an article here from Sky Sports. Harry Maguire mentioned that captain keeps armband as he awaits retrial. He says, um, Maguire was handed a 20 month, a 21 month suspended sentence on Tuesday after being found guilty by a Greek court of aggra- aggravated assault, resisting arrest and repeated attempts of bribery. The 27 year old was convicted of all the charges against him by a court on the island of Cyrus. He was arrested with his brother and friend after a fight broke out while he was on holiday in Mykonos over claimed to sit on injected and suspected rape drug. Uh, however, on Wednesday, United confirmed in a statement that Maguire's legal team had an appeal accepted adding this means that harry has no criminal record and is once again presumed innocent until proven guilty it is understood no date has yet been set for the appeal and united are aware that a number of months before the case is heard again which again i just don't think social has really got enough issues to deal with in terms of how to handle the glazers and what to do with the transfers and you know the squad evolution and if we're going to challenge for trophies he doesn't need his trouble. He doesn't need his, this this headache. Um, Maguire should just be stripped of the captaincy and we should just move on. So this isn't a constant conversation in the press conference along with if we're going to sign Jadon Sancho or not. It's not the headache that we need. But again, I'm not too sure. Man United are so weird these days. They might actually like this in attention. They might think these clicks and this engagement is a good thing bizarre um sky sports user understands Maguire has left greece and is expected to return to manchester in the coming days following the court's original verdict the defender was withdrawn from the gary south england squad having been initially selected in the most national that's a one that's an idiot in it southgate is such a numpty have how to deal with stuff really badly again may not have a bit more skin in the game because we're paying this guy he's our marquee signing we have to kind of treat it a little bit differently but england heard this story but Southgate still included him into the squad because he said he spoke to him and he says the story that you heard isn't true. He gets found guilty, so then Southgate has to take him out because he's found guilty. And now he's, he has the appeal that means he's innocent and still proven guilty and now he's still out of the squad. It's like, just put him on standby when the allegations came out first with England. We've got enough central defenders. We've got more central defenders that you can wave a stick at. It doesn't really matter who plays back there, right? Effectively, kind of. Don't, don't get me wrong. There are good and bad defenders, but that's not the problem position. Put him on standby for the time being. He's been involved in a term, you know, in a really stressful situation, it seems like, for the most part. The probably last thing he wants to do is come back and play football anyway. He probably wants to get this out of the way and make sure he clears his name as soon as possible. Then he can move on with football. I don't know. Maybe some people are different. And that's how I would imagine it. Put him on standby until the, the verdict has been, you know, sorted out and the case has been, you know, um, concluded. And then include him. But no, you include him. Then you have to take him out. Now he's in to proving guilty. And then what? It's like madness.
Um, uh, uh, da, 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 da. I think it's season gives them time. But yeah, I don't know, man. What do you guys think, man? Should he be sure to the captaincy? Um, is it a bit OTT? Um, do you think there is, um, he's being treated with kid gloves with, you know, other players won't be treated with the same thing. Um, does his performance have anything to do with it too? Should somebody that's performing as me, not mediocre, but like as met as he has in the last few weeks be given this kind of allowance to do what he's done? Let me know in the comments down below. I'll be intrigued to know your thoughts. Okay. Next on the list, we have some interesting news regarding podcasting. Um, Joe Budden or the Joe Budden podcast has officially left Spotify. Um, they announced it yesterday uh, via their podcast that comes out twice a week, Wednesdays and Saturday. And um, yeah, we're not surprised as fans. I'm a big fan of the show, regardless. So I'll put that out there in the front. I've listened to the show since the beginning, since it was called I'll Name This Podcast Later. Big fan of what Joe's kind of done with his career in terms of really rewriting the narrative. He was somebody that was sort of like not real, not, I, I would, he probably he would he'd get offended by this, but I think Joe was probably... Um, seen in the same light as someone like an Ebro. He was like tolerated but not liked, right? In terms of his personality, he just kind of rubbed people up the wrong way. And I guess with Ebro, he sort of kind of lent into the fact that he's a bit of a, he's a bit of a dinosaur in some ways and and kind of, you know, he has this kind of persona of being like the gatekeeper and, you know, the enforcer of the community, making sure things are kept a certain way. I don't know, whatever persona he has, I don't keep press what he does, but I, I wouldn't, at the time, I thought they were both in the same kind of distasteful basket, but somehow via the podcast and oddly enough via his last appearance in Love and Hip Hop, he kind of rewritten the narrative about how he, who he was as a person and people tend to like him a little bit more. And of course, you know, having a podcast with somebody that's a former rapper or that was somebody that was plugged in, especially from New York, you know, with the music industry being uh, predominantly based in New York, it was a really rare insight into what goes on. Um, uh, behind the scenes with artists their kind of way of thinking um, some of his interviews on the pull up are you know really ex ex um, incredible in that regard because it seems like you know the same way that you get with athletics you know, former sportsman to former sportsman, you get a different sort of interview. The same with um, Joe Budden on his podcast. The fact that, you know, he's in the industry. Um, Rory and Ma obviously work behind the scenes too. There's a different sort of understanding. Parks, of course, has worked on various, you know, uh, legendary albums that you guys are familiar with. There's a different sort of depth and feel to how they kind of cover um, current hip-hop topics. So again, one of my favorite stuff, one of my favorite podcasts, podcasts to listen to, hands down. But of course, throughout the last few months, we have seen a little bit of tension on the podcast. The tone has changed somewhat. Um, they've sounded a bit dour, a bit defeatist in terms of their renegotiation with Spotify. And in my opinion, I think that the, the cards came tumbling down the moment Joe Rogan signed his deal with Spotify. I think there was this assumption, I think behind the scenes, maybe with them, again, I'm only reading between lines from what I've kind of listened to, that I think they were, Spotify came and made it seem as if they were giving the priority of signing these networks, right? They obviously gave um, Amy Schumer, Joe Budden, a few other people that launched the, and I, f and I forgot who that chubby model is, the big lady, something Graham, right? I forget a lady. Anyway, the kind of a uh, plus woman model. Um, there was a few people who kind of launched a podcast first on Spotify exclusive deal. <clears throat> But then they felt like Spotify changed their model and were moving towards doing more network sort of stuff, right? Picking up Gimlet, obviously the Bill Simmons stuff and a few other places. So it wouldn't surprise me if Joe Budden and the crew, even though they were aware that it was bullshit, they maybe convinced themselves, okay, cool, fair enough. They're giving the bags to people that are bringing networks to the company because it's more beneficial for them. They get more of a return on investment if they sign a network as opposed to an individual, right? You'd, you'd think that's the case. So that makes more sense. Okay, cool, I understand it. But then when they sign Joe Rogan, who's a single entity or is like a personality, right? A public figure. And that's he doesn't have a network. He's just got his Joe Rogan Experience podcast, which is the, you know, one of the premier podcasts in the world, if not the best one in the world, but still it's one person. He's not bringing a network with him. It sort of changed the thing. Like, hold on a minute. You're giving one guy the same amount of bags you're giving networks, but then you're offering us far less than you're giving each, either of them. And it just didn't make any sense, especially when you listen to Joe mentioning that they wanted to get splits from these other deals that he was doing um, or other programs he was doing, like the pull-up. They wanted to bring the pull-up um, in-house at Spotify. They wanted to bring, I think, some other things. I forgot what else he mentions on there, but it just didn't seem like a fair deal. And considering the other deals they've done, especially with Joe Rogan, considering that they leaked the information regarding his um, the amount it's going to be, the, the contract, 200 million or whatever, 100 million, regardless of what you think. I think it's free. It's anywhere between 50 to 300 million for Joe Rogan to sign a licensing deal with Spotify, right? For like five or six years. I forgot how long it is. But I'm sure that really did um, ruffle their feathers. And in all honesty, considering the numbers that they do specifically just on, just on Spotify, and then you add the metrics 
that they get from YouTube. I think they put the the full YouTube show out a couple of days or a few days after it launches on Spotify. They're well within their rights to be agreed by it. And I guess because Spotify didn't want to renege or renegotiate, they've had to walk away. And now they're going to uh, put their podcast everywhere else apart from Spotify, I guess, exclusively on all other platforms, I'm assuming. And then I guess in the next few weeks, we're going to find out where exactly they're going to uh, sit the podcast um, full time. But this is an article here from Variety. It says, Joe Biden says, splitting from Spotify, claims platform, undermined and undervalued exclusive podcasts i said a uh, popular podcast and host and cultural commentator joe budden said he would leave spotify after a two-year exclusive run of his joe budden podcast with rory and mal on the service um claiming the audio provider is pillaging his audience which i definitely agree because oddly enough i only got spotify because of the joe budden podcast again I, i'm a stringent um user of apple itunes i still use it now because i dj i think it's the best thing to use to kind of manage your files i've got playlists I've got stuff saved in genre by comments. You know, I've got my whole system that I kind of export. Um, I import stuff into um, iTunes and I export it into stuff like Serato or Recordbox to get prepared for USBs and to plan CDJs. But I specifically signed up for Spotify because of the JVP podcast. So I can only imagine the amount of value they've brought to that company, the amount of users. Um, the amount, and again, now I'm a fan of Spotify. So even though I, I, I don't use it as much as I would other people would, I don't use playlists and stuff. I still listen to like, you know that's my usually i download hip-hop albums and then i listen to every other genre via spotify whether it's classical uh punk rock indie metal all the stuff i listen to via spotify so i'm constantly using it in the background regardless so i can only imagine how many other people have the same story as i do um so yeah that's definitely bringing a lot of value to the table he says um in the most recent podcast episode on wednesday 26 Biden spent the better time of three plus hours disconstructing the deal with the streaming platform suggesting that he will no longer be on Spotify when the exclusive contract expires in a month, representing about seven more episodes. Um, September 23rd, I cannot tell you where this podcast will be, but as it stands, I can tell you where it will not be in that Spotify. The Love and Hip Hop alumnus and host of the Revolt State of the Culture is also a former rapper whose twice weekly podcast is rated as number one podcast on Spotify in the past. It's currently number 15 on Spotify, which is ironic, right? The moment they decided to renegotiate, they decided to plummet down the ratings which is fucking funny right um especially again considering they've got a podcast as, as exclusively on spotify then they were just doing not crazy numbers and then you you think about it being a really niche audience that watches that sort of thing um they cover niche topics it's not like a general topic kind of like everyday you know um, living sort of thing it's sort of specifically uh viewed through the lens of hip-hop and everything else that kind of ascertains to it so the numbers that they're getting are really high when you compare it to all the other general shows um in recent weeks Budden has been telling listeners about his unhappiness with the current arrangement before I announced Wednesday that he's planning to take the show elsewhere. And I think this is, I've got this weird theory, right? Because I think he mentioned it previously about being undervalued and feeling like um, they didn't exactly uh, bring a deal that made sense in terms of the value they brought to the company and the kind of impact that they have on culture. Fair. But the same thing happened with him at Complex, um, right? Where he essentially felt as if he was undervalued. He created um, the Everyday Struggle show. Um, he had different views about how to kind of expand the show he was one that kind of you know championed them to get a female host uh, brought academics in like just some really interesting stuff right and you know everyday struggle still going now and i'm sure apart from everyday struggle and maybe full size run there's not a lot of complex shows that do really good numbers um especially when you discount stuff like um uh first we feast and all that stuff right if it's just like complex in-house stuff you know those are probably the two biggest programs on there so he played a big role in that but there's a part of me that thinks the reason why he doesn't get valued is maybe because of his past. Like, he just can't shake that kind of stigma off of him. Is that a thing? Do you think all of his... Because I've always been intrigued. Because I think you mentioned it a few times in the podcast. Oh, the reason why he goes on Love of Hip Hop is because for the money, right? They pay really well. But it always kind of annoyed me when you'd go back on there. I'd be like, you don't need to do this, right? You're you're finally starting to... Because it, it took a long time for Joe Biden to be accepted as a podcaster, not looked at as a rapper turned podcaster right because a lot of artists would still artists get annoyed now when he criticizes their music because it feels if hey you are one of us right you should there's like a sacred uh brotherhood that we share where you don't necessarily disparage a fellow artist in public right you know how hard it is to do this stuff that we do there's other things that go on that the fans don't know about blah blah, blah. but there's a little thing that you know there's kind of an unwritten rule about not criticizing your own um you know people within your own community or people your peers yeah so he finally has kind of crossed over and he's become, I think, more so a cultural commentator. People kind of look at him as that more so. Um, and people don't get as butt hurt if he kind of trashes your album. But I think there is still a bit of kind of 
smut on his name about his association. He he's kind of reverence with love and hip hop. Um, the idea that he kind of always goes for birds and stuff, right? In terms of the women he chooses in his life, um, some of maybe his style choices. I don't know. There there must be something that he's done in the past that's still affecting the way he gets viewed because on paper this guy's a mogul, right? He's an absolute. He's a mogul in the same way that you look at someone like a P Diddy in the same in the same exact way, right? In his own way, he has definitely reshaped the way people look at hip hop podcasts or the way people look at podcasts within the hip hop scene in general. He's made it cool. There was a time when people used to talk about podcasts being. Remember Ebro when that, he made that slight towards them, like, "Oh, your little podcast," right? That was when that time when people were like looking at it like a dickhead thing. It's like um. It's like um, when The Breakfast Club launched um, or when The Breakfast Club was doing a lot of their interviews on YouTube, that's how they kind of crushed the game, right? Because a lot of other radio shows are like, oh, that YouTube thing is dumb. And now suddenly everyone's got a YouTube channel. So he's a pioneer in that respect. But there is a part of me that thinks <clears throat> a lot of the reason why he doesn't get the love or he doesn't get the respect that he deserves within those big boardrooms is because of his association with some of the messier parts of hip-hop, his constant beefs with everybody in the scene, you know, from fucking basketball players to wives of rappers. Like, he's always had some sort of tippy tap tip -ta um, with somebody. Maybe that's kind of hurt him in the long run. And again, maybe that's a, a lesson to be learned from everybody out there, especially if you're coming up. Reputational damage is real. You have to be very conscious about protecting your brand and your reputation. I think nowadays, artists nowadays are more conscious about it. I think that's why Joe Biden sometimes can get a bit frustrated with the lack of information and the walls some artists put up nowadays because they're very conscious about making sure they're controlling the narrative in some way, shape or form, right? They have to be because the moment you let the narrative get out of hand or get a little bit crazy, your brand really suffers and it's really difficult to come back from. Um, it continues here. It says, Spotify has never cared about his podcast individually, Joe Budden said. Spotify only cared about our contribution to the platform. Budden added that his talk show has been undermined and undervalued, pointing to a recent deal with Bill Simmons, the ringer for 250 million, which he said actively pitting silence against us, which is true. And I guess it's not bad. Spotify has disclosed that it will pay 50 up to 196 for the ringer, which is fine, right? Obviously, with I guess with add-ons, it might pay two hundred fifty million. I don't think that's a problem. I think he even mentioned it. Um, I think it's again another NFL analogy. I remember watching some show in the NFL. I forgot which one it was, but one of the guys, <coughs> he's like a legend. <coughs> he mentioned that um, he knew every season because he wasn't a star player, but every new season he knew his spot was up for grabs because his team were actively drafting somebody, um, a, a really high-ranking prospect a really well-regarded prospect in his position every season, right? Someone will get drafted a new person. So every season he would be, he'd kind of have to kind of prove his worth to the organization. And he did so, right? He kind of put that person on the bench. He was starting again. Every season, every season, every season, kind of kept him on his toes for 15 years in the NFL, let's say, right? That's not an issue. I don't think it's a problem bringing in somebody and doing that to kind of push the other podcast a bit further. But the problem comes when you get around the negotiation table and I know what that other person's getting. It's like at work, right? This is the main issue I think I have with corporate in uh, with the workplace in general especially even startups right there is this kind of thing where no one really talks about money and money is called like an afterthought and it's more so about um believing in a brand and giving everything for the company to go to the next level and deconstruct what's that what's that thing called um what's that what could we gonna be the uh, what's that phrase that we just in startups not um anyway there's a phrase you just start us but it's this idea that the company is bigger than the individuals and you should commit to it like an Apple thing and, you know, down its sword over there. Fine. But if I find out my colleague who I'm working with, who's kind of, especially in my, in social, in marketing, where I work in my kind of area of expertise, there's always that person that works within your marketing team that swans around, comes in late, leaves early, um, always got their, their laptop underneath their, their flipping um, armpit, um, talking on the phone to somebody, securing kind of these phantom deals and you find out that they are, you know, they're paying, I don't know, 50 grand more than you a month or whatever it may be, or a year, you're going to want to ask them questions and you're going to want to renegotiate your salary based on what they get. But then if you can't acknowledge that and you can't even say, hey, that's true, that maybe that person's getting overpaid or maybe we should bring your pay in line with what they're getting paid so there's some sort of structure or there's some sort of tier or whatever it may be called, that's when it gets annoying. And I think if you're Joe Budden and you honestly can sit there and say, hey, um, I don't know about you, but my podcast, even though it might not be as well known as a ringer, it has more cultural and social relevance, right? The stuff they talk about on the Joe Biden podcast will end up getting being coming viral, being clipped. Especially and the thing with Joe Biden podcast, you have to imagine too. I think part of the reason why a lot of the stuff doesn't get clipped as often as it does because the show's sort of staggered, right? So it's like Wednesday drop on audio, then it comes out what visually on on Saturday. For the most part, they don't want to release 
for the most part, viral meme or blog sites don't want to put out audio clips. <clears throat> They'd rather put out audio video because obviously that's more engaging. So by the time that clip um, becomes viral, that news piece that you spoke about is out of the news cycle. So that's part of the reason why they're suffering. But still, they're still able to get viral. They're still able to kind of break the internet in their own little way. So you could argue that even though maybe the ringer might be a bit more of a household name, I could even, I'm not even sure if that's even true, your brand has more cultural impact. So how can I not be even in line or even anywhere near it, especially if you're talking about three digit millions, right? And you're offering me two digits. It's like, come on, that's insane. Um, uh, Spotify rep declined to comment, of course, saying the buttons were ongoing, saying talks with buttons were ongoing. I think, as you mentioned, there's still a deal on the table that they have from before that hasn't been re that hasn't been rejigged. But I think the issue is, well, they wanted him to do to put everything in one deal, like the stuff he's doing outside of Spotify, all the YouTube stuff that he's doing, the partnerships with, um, what's it called? Cash App. Like, that's insane. You shouldn't do that. Button accused Spotify apologizing his audience as a way to build up his broader podcasting strategy. Uh, Ispo, sorry. Um, said, you pillage your audience from the podcast and you've continued to pillage each step of the way without any regard, which I definitely agree with. I think that era when they were having that kind of promo code um, and they were offering people discounts on, you know, the first few months of signing up to Spotify, I'm sure they got thousands, if not millions of new users. Again, like myself, I am a stringent user of Apple iTunes. I DJ. Most DJs use Apple iTunes because you can download tunes and put them into your library and organize them in a certain way. Like it's a, it's a still a, a well-used tool outside of Apple Music. I'm only using Spotify because of this podcast. So I can only imagine other people that are a bit more normie than I am. Um, he says the step of the way for listeners. He said, in addition, Budden um, compared the Spotify podcast business to his experience in music business, where he said artists are typically exploited financially. He also mentioned by name Spotify executives who are no longer with the company, but were instrumental in bringing him to streaming platforms such as Tuma Bassa, who created Spotify's um, curators rap caviar playlist and is now the executive at Urban. Yeah, I think he's Herb, head of Urban at YouTube Music as well. Uh, he says, we can't really talk about no business between us before I know what took place with you, me and my brother Tuma. He said, Budden, but, uh, Bassa left in Spotify March 2018 prior to Budden's podcast becoming exclusive to Spotify, which is true. Um, rap caviar, I don't really listen to the, spot, the playlist, but I know how important it is in culture. I know how important it is to artists. I know how important it is to labels and to the business that gets done. So for somebody that curated that list to suddenly leave Spotify, which is, seems like a rocket ship, on its ascendancy to go to somewhere like YouTube maybe speaks to what's going on behind the scenes and again that's the issue I have I think behind the scenes especially in the entertainment industry especially within this cultural thing especially between minorities we need to talk openly about what's going on with our deals so that the next person coming behind you doesn't have to suffer we have to suffer because I think there is a part of me that thinks you know some people some people are not made for some organizations right you can go in somewhere with the best intentions but you just can't work well but you owe it yourself to give the other person who maybe can stomach more than you can an opportunity to flourish by providing them with all necessary information, all necessary tools to navigate that kind of sharky infested water that is corporate world, right? Especially in the upper, in the upper kind of C-suite levels of decision making or whatever it may be called, right? You need somebody that is aware of what's going on, has their kind of, you know, um, has a bit of nouts of what the culture is going on there. It's a bit hard to deal with. It's not the same as, you know, working freelance. Um, it continues here. By the first launch podcast in early 2015 before he brought it exclusively to Spotify under the deal in August 2018. The show is also distributed on YouTube. The Joe Budden podcast by Rory Moore is hosted by Budden alongside his friends, Rory. Um, so Jamal Mal Clay and Rory Farrell. The show focuses on hip-hop news, events and a culture, but the discussion spans a wide range of topics including sports, entertainment and their own lives. Budden called the Howard Stern a hip-hop, blah, blah, blah. He said, oh, so uh, still Budden added, I don't want to come off angry, upset or bitter because the reality is we both hit our goals. So yeah, I think I think it'd be great to have them more because I think he mentioned it before. It'd be great to have everything kind of in all on one platform because maybe he's okay with giving them the pull up and these other shows, but he wants a deal that is equitable, or a deal that makes sense. That makes sense. That makes complete. And I think again, the pull up on on Spotify or the pull up with a YouTube partnership would be insane considering the musical guests they get on there. Um, but the, it has to make economic sense. Um, the the disgusting thing was the a supposed story about Spotify offering to give them watches as a as a thank you gift or something which again because i've worked because again having my experience working in nike because that's a, that's the issue when you when you're younger and you have this fanciful images about these brands that you know and love you sometimes especially if you're curate especially if you're a creator especially if somebody that wants to get involved and make things you're not just a kind of active consumer or just a consumer in general um you want to work for these companies. You want to kind of like um, imprint, leave your imprint there, right? Uh, you know, leave your little mark on the on their kind of timeline of success. 
So you apply Apple, Spotify, Nike, Adidas. Then when you get behind the curtain, you realize that God almighty, man, the business is a bit dodge how it's run. And most of it's quite political. Some people that that stay the longest are usually the least talented. Um, they're most they're usually the most agreeable type people. The people that are able to kind of dance to certain different tunes, are able to kind of maneuver in the right way. And usually the people that are forward thinking and pushing things are usually the people that kind of come from the outside and just work on a project for the time being and then sort of dip. But there's no one really in house that's really pushing things forward because you wouldn't need somebody like a tumor to kind of get hired by Spotify if they had that culture in the first place. But there are signs when you work in those companies that it's going to go downhill. And they're usually odd. They're usually weird signs like, I don't know, team meeting budgets being slashed, right? You're not allowed to use a company car to take new hirees out anymore. Um, I don't know, weird things, right? Just stuff happens. Or maybe you'd have to downgrade your laptops. There's certain things that happen that just gives you a kind of an inkling, of course, of like, okay, cool. If, they don't, if, not, if they're not willing to allow me to take my car to go give my staff um you know a thank you meal at nando's that means there's no point in me even trying to budget in this kind of pop-up experience that i'm kind of launching or this new um product uh feature there's no point in even suggesting it if they're not able to kind of fund that and i think he, the writing was on a wall the moment they offered to kind of give them a holiday no they, they didn't they didn't work in a, a holiday in their contracts number one so they have to kind of approve it and they didn't want to approve it they didn't want to give them christmas off which is nuts of course they're freelancers okay we understand that but not having some time to give your podcasters the opportunity to go and live life and come back and be able to talk about their experiences is absolutely insane especially when it comes around those kind of you know uh brick and mortar holidays like christmas right it's not like a another weird thing that you're going on but the writing was on a wall with the watches episode it's supposed to be they offered to give them watches as a thank you gift. They obviously send their list of watches. Spotify come back and say they're too expensive. Then they offer to to they say, hey, can you choose some used ones? They go and choose some used ones. Doesn't happen. Then eventually they didn't, never got the watches. And this was something that they were offered, right? So if they're trying to like count pennies with the watches, but they're willing to give Joe Rogan the bag, it either means they don't value you or they think that all the money isn't really there. And from working in Spotify, sorry, from working in startups and working in other places that I won't mention, they might say they have certain amounts of money in the bank, but they don't usually have that money in the bank. They're usually leveraging or future project. It's usually they're kind of counting on money that hasn't actually hit their bank. They're hoping that if they announce this deal with Joe Rogan, that's going to push other things forward. That's going to allow the investment from that group to come forth. Blah, 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 blah. There's loads of funny games that they play. And unfortunately, if you're somebody with not the same amount of clout as a Joe Rogan, you're going to be left by the side as Joe Biden has. But... I think they've maybe underestimated his value because this news is everywhere. They've covered it on, you know, there's, it's on The Verge, Variety, Billboard. This is big, big ticket news. And I think for most streaming platforms, if they see the numbers that have been quoted in the articles and look at it just in terms of black and white and take away Joe, Joe Biden's maybe likability as a person, I'm not too sure, they definitely see that it's bad business. They have to give him a deal because, you know, letting him walk into another platform makes no sense. Um, he might take some customers with him as well. And again, it's just not, you know, it's not it's not sound mind thinking in terms of future projecting or what you want to do going forward. And I think, you know, it's a ready-made um, program with loads of other features that could easily be plugged in with stuff that Spotify are doing at the moment. And yeah, I think they're going to work it out. But I think it's an interesting deal going forward in terms of the future of podcasting. Um, I like that Joe Biden is so adverse to ads I've, me, I've been in the same way I think in my regard I'd rather get my Patreon and my views up and just claim money that side than have to do you know mad ads or if I do do ads I'd have to do them in a way that Joe Biden I mean Joe Rogan does them where he sort of just front loads them right he just bangs them all out in the front and then that's it there's no mid rolls and all that sort of annoying stuff that they do so all that most podcasters do at the moment and again, we're in this weird place where we, they keep mentioning what's the value of a stream, man? Like, we don't really know what the value of a stream is. Like, and I know for myself, in terms of a consumer, the amount of times I've bought, I've bought books by listening to podcasts, I've booked certain holidays, I purchased certain clothing items, I've, um, you know, um, decided to eat at a certain restaurant. Like, you don't understand what the value, especially when it comes to podcasts, the amount of information, the amount of uh, products and services that can get dropped and named and all that sort of stuff via, you know, a one hour and a half plus podcast is insane. So the value needs to be, you know, there needs to be, um, and there needs to be, there needs to make a, there needs to be a fee that makes sense with the value that you're giving in that regard. So yeah, let me know your thoughts, man. What do you think? Is it a good idea for Joe Biden to put this news out there? Should he have been so transparent? Did Spotify fumble the bag? did joe fumble the bag where should joe go next let me know in the comments down below i'd love to hear your thoughts next on the list we have 
a really amazing and rousing speech from Jerry Seinfeld regarding New York. And this is like a short one, but this is not nothing to do with, you know, where I live. But um, COVID has been interesting, right? Because we've seen uh, the lack of leadership from a lot of leaders in various countries. Most of the countries within the Western world, let alone the places within Central and Eastern Europe. But it seems as if like um, it turns into a, a complete, instead of it being an, an issue of trying to inspire or reassure your populace it's turned into a, a, a weird political battleground uh between varying forces vying for power and the people that are left you know sort of like you know trying to gather their scraps count their pennies and keep a roof over their heads are us we're the ones that are suffering and we don't really get any source of inspiration there's no source of hope or motivation or an idea on how things can get better right we know times are hard we know it's going to be worse before it gets better but let's give us some something to hold on to and jerry sanford in an odd weird way in his own in his own weird way done it in this article which is a response to a uh, james ultra article in the new york post where he basically argues that new york is not going to be the same as it was right because obviously there's all these articles of people leaving new york and going to um upstate new york or going to places in jersey or places that neighbor it within a country because now with offices and all those kind of things closing down there's no real need to be located in such a popular city especially with the coronavirus hanging around it's probably the worst um, area to live in if you want to um not get sick right so jerry sanford kind of rebuttal to that article um titled here jerry sanford so you think new york is dead it's not in brackets i'll read a bit of it for you because i think it's a really rousing speech that you would have assumed um a politician should have been able to give to us um in some way shape or form regardless of what country you live in this is what people should be saying to kind of give us some hope but they're not instead they're just using it as a political warfare to kind of you know maintain any kind of semblance of power they have so it goes like this when i got my first apartment in manhattan in the hot summer 1967 there was no proper scooper law there's no people scooper law uh, the streets were covered in dog crap i signed a rental agreement walked outside and my car had been towed i still thought this is the greatest place i've ever uh, been in my life manhattan is an island off the coast of america are we part of the United States? Kind of. This is one of those, um, and this is one of the toughest times we've been in for quite a while. But one thing I know for sure, the last thing we need in the thick of so many challenges is some putts on, link on LinkedIn waiting and whimpering. Everyone's gone. I want 2019 back. Oh, shut up. Imagine being in a real war with this guy by your side. Listen to him go, I used to play chess all day. I could meet people. I could start any type of business. Wipe your tears, wipe your butt and pull it together. He says he knows people who have left New York for Maine, Vermont, Tennessee, Indiana. I've been to all of those places many, many times over many decades. And with all due respect and affection, are you kidding me? He says everyone's gone good. Um, how the hell do you know? Uh, you moved to Miami. Yes, I have a place out in Long Island, but I will never abandon New York City ever. Now, again, you know, Jerry Sanford's experience in New York City is different from your regular, you know, um, up and coming artist or young person. I'm sure I'm assuming same with John's Altucher, right? Uh, but there is some semblance of truth what George James Altucher was talking about. But I love the rousingness, the rousing nature of this article. He continues. He says, and I've been on stage at comedy club stand up NY quite a few times. I could I I could use a little sprucing up. It could use a bit of sprucing up, if you don't mind me saying. I wouldn't worry about it. You can do it from Miami. There are some other because obviously James also should own stand up NY. Um said there are some other stupid thing in the article about bandwidth and how New York is over because people will remote everything. Guess what? Everyone hates to do this. Everyone hates it. You know what? There's no energy. Energy, attitude, and personality cannot be remoted through even the best fiber optic lens. That's the whole reason many of us moved to New York in the first place. I'm not too sure about that. I do think the remote um, working trend is a thing now. I think many companies will just look at it in terms of economics. It's not even about having bandwidth and about the internet being better. It's just a purely an economic thing. If you can save, let's say, 1.5 mil, half a mil on your rent yearly, especially in an economy that's already down with people not spending as much because they're not in work, they don't have as much disposable income, their future's uncertain. It's going to be a net positive for your company going forward, especially if it means you you saving money on your rent means that you can pay your staff and not let go of anybody. Everybody wins. Do you know what I mean? You get some good positive press and your 
employees get to keep a roof over their heads. But I think this remote working thing is going to be a thing going forward. I think we're going to have satellite offices still. Some of our bigger brands are going to want marquee office spaces. They're going to probably snap up some spaces because they're going to be cheap. But this idea that everyone's going to be needed to work, especially if you work on a laptop like I do, you're not going to be needed to go in the office as much as you did in the past. And that's just going to be a thing going forward. I think we can't change that. I think that's just the future um, hitting us a lot sooner than it would have maybe if we didn't have COVID. He says here, um, you ever wonder why Silicon Valley even exists? I have always wondered, why do these people all live and work in that location? They have all this insane technology. Why don't they just all spread out wherever they want to be and connect with their devices? Because it doesn't work. That's why. No, it does work. I think that's fake. That's not, not fake. That's incorrect. There's many companies in Silicon Valley who are Silicon Valley type companies who aren't in Silicon Valley. Um, I think of Salesforce being one of the biggest ones, right? But there's loads of other examples. And even more so now, loads of companies are leaving Silicon Valley because of the politics involved, um, because of the taxes, all that sort of good stuff, because of the rent of course it's ridiculously expensive um so this idea that silicon valley and again there are always scenes that kind of you know birthed in certain areas and there's a cashment there's a kind of a law that happens to an area but over time people will soon realize that you don't need to be there to kind of make it and i guess that's what's happening in silicon valley like in the other place it continues um real life inspiring human energy exists when we co uh Colligate, is it Colligate? Colligate together in crazy places like New York City. I'm feeling sorry for yourself because you can't go to the theater for a while. It's not the essential element of character that made New York the brilliant diamond of activity. Um, it will one day be again. You found a place in Florida. Fine. We know that sharp focus and restless and res resilient creative spirit that Florida is all about. You think Rome is going away too? London, Tokyo, the East Village? Um, they're not. They change. They mutate. They reform because greatness is rare and the true greatness of New York City is beyond rare. Again, that's what you want to hear from your politicians, isn't it? Said it's unknown. The unknown any place outside New York City. You know New York will not bounce back. back. You say New York will not bounce back this time. You will not bounce back. In your enverated, pastel-filled new life in Florida, I hope you have a long, healthy run down there. I can't think of a more fitting retribution for your fine article. This stupid virus will give up eventually the same way you have. We're going to keep going with New York if that's all right with you and we will sure as hell be back because all that's real and tough New Yorkers who, unlike you, loved it, understood it, stayed and rebuilt it. See you at the club. Oosh. Good article, man. I liked it. Um, and again, there are a bit, you know, there are a bit some snarky barbs in there, but I think for the most part, the rousing nature of it is something that I think should be said a lot more by our politicians, but instead, they're all playing power games. What can you do? Interesting story here regarding COVID. There was a story here um, that was really interesting regarding the idea that, you know, some people argue, oh, masks don't work, right? Or I can't wear a mask because I can't breathe. Well, it proves that masks are very effective within, you know, in indoor spaces, right? That's where COVID spreads the most. I think there's a lot of science out there that proves or that argues that COVID doesn't necessarily spread um, with the same amount of ferocity as it would do outdoors v indoors. Um, so if you're indoors, just wear a face mask. Okay? It is what it is. Especially if you're going to be indoors for a prolonged period of time and you're not eating or drinking. This is an article from Starbucks that says, Starbucks Cafe COVID outbreak spread employees um, who wore masks, right? It says, after a woman with coronavirus visited the Starbucks cafe in north of Seoul this month, more than two dozen patrons tested positive days later. But the four face mask wearing employees escaped infection, which is incredible considering, you know, the people that you're speaking to the most strangers wise would be the would be the cashiers or the people working behind the till at Starbucks, the people collecting cups, cleaning around you. Right, they've been the ones you're communicating the most outside of your friends just sitting at the table. So for them not to get it shows that face masks obviously do work. Of face coverings. August 8th outbreak in South Korea city of Paju is another example of how rapid the SARS COVID virus can spread in a confined indoor spaces, as well as the ways to minimize transition, transmission, sorry, with health authorities around the world still debating evidence around face masks. The 27 person cluster linked to the air conditioned coffee outlet adds more support for the mandatory use to help limit the spread. This quote. This speaks volumes about the role masks play, said Ma Sang Hyuk, a peer. Uh, Pediatric infectious disease physician at the Shangwan Fatima Hospital in South Korea. Masks may not provide 100% protection, but there's nothing and there, there's nothing out there that's as effective, which is true. And that's what you hear a lot of these Karen say, a lot of these mask deniers. Oh, you know, you're breathing back in oxygen. It's only 99. It's only 70% um, useful. It's like I'd rather 70. I'd rather 30, 40 than nothing. 
Um, guidance of face mask is being issued from Australia to Venezuela to help stem the pandemic, which has affected more than 23 million people and killed at least 800,000 plus worldwide. The face covering will become mandatory in New Zealand for residents using public transport and inside ride sharing vehicles. Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern said Monday last week the World Health Organization issued uh, advice for the use of children. But yeah, I don't, I just don't get why this is an issue. Again, a, a standard article here kind of proving that they work. Um, I think the woman in question was sitting underneath an air conditioning unit. That's why it spread really quickly to a lot of people. Um, she didn't know she had COVID as well. She was asymptomatic. And then, you know, the people that were wearing the mask indoors didn't get it. Now, fair enough. It's a Starbucks. So people were probably taking their mask on and off to, you know, to eat and drink. But the common suggestion out there is that if you're going to drink and eat, take your mask off. Once you're finished, put your mask back on again. It is what it is, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, be safe out there if you are going to restaurants. Next, we've got news about a $5 test kit, which is cool. I think they're trying to make this... Um, in terms of uh, helping out schools when they reopen or yeah, right. Cause they're going to reopen now. I think there's no, there's no real way around it. I think they've kind of realized that they have to reopen schools and get kids back into schools. They have to give parents that bit of respite. Um, kids have to have the ability to go back and have that kind of developmental um, experiences that school gives you. And um, this five, $5 coronavirus test um, <laughs> is a really good way to go back. Cause I mentioned, I remember reading something about, um, I saw an article about a test that you could use saliva with, not mucus, of course, but um, use it only saliva and it works really quickly as well, um, instead of it being intrusive to your nose, because I think the, the nasal thing is quite hard to use, I think if you're not used to doing it right, because I know when I did my first test, I, it kind of came back inconclusive because I wasn't able to put it um, too far up my nostril due to my sinus issues, but I think um, this is a great test because I think you have to, you dip the actual thing in a little plastic, it's like a little oyster card thing and it kind of has got a little hole that you dip it in and it changes colour and I guess where you get results from, but anyway, this is really the article to find out more. So from Yahoo News, it says, a rapid $5 coronavirus test doesn't need specialty, um, specialty equipment. It says here, Food and Drug Administration, uh, the FDA on Wednesday authorized the rapid coronavirus test that doesn't need any special computer equipment to get the results. The 15 minute test from Abbott Laboratories will sell, will sell for $5, which is great, right? Because I think that's the, that's the probably the thing that's affecting a lot. Because I think even shows, Dave Chappelle's doing it at the moment. Supposedly, I've heard Dave Chappelle's comedy shows that he's doing in Ohio, where he lives at the moment, where he's sort of flying out comedians and having them perform at this amazing field and having musicians play, no cameras or phones allowed, like really um, immersive experience. He's sort of like shelling out close to 100,000 on test alone, right? To kind of make sure, you know, the virus doesn't spread um, with that many people in one place but of course he's got the funds to do so and if you've got that kind of money why not use it to kind of give back and allow your friends to earn a bit of coin too but i think for other people for schools and kind of lower level performers or promoters it'll be handy if you have the opportunity to buy a test such as this to kind of give your performers and maybe your patrons a peace of mind that they need the 15 minute da -da -da, the size of a credit card the self-contained test is based on the same technology used to test for the flu strep throat and other infections it's the latest cheaper simpler test to hit the u.s market providing new options to expand testing as schools and businesses struggle to reopen and flu season approaches the fda also see, uh, recently green lighted the saliva test from yale university i mentioned that bypasses some of the supplies that have led to testing bottlenecks which i guess in terms of the things that you put in your nose that's some good stuff so that makes sense uh both tests have limitations and neither can be done at home several companies have are developing rapid at home testing but none have yet won approval so you can't do it at home so how do you do it? okay so you, okay you have to do it at place but at least you can get the test done straight away and it's only five dollars that makes sense abbott's new test still require a nasal swab by health worker like most older coronavirus tests so i guess you can still hire a health worker to go do it the same i'm assuming what they're doing at ohio the yale saliva test eliminates the need for a swab but can only be run at a high grade laboratories in general um, rapid tests like Abbott's are less accurate than lab developed tests. The FDA said in a statement announcing the decision that negative results of Abbott's test may need uh, to be confirmed with a lab test in some cases. The agency granted Abbott's test an emergency use uh, authorization late Wednesday for patients and with suspected COVID-19. The two additions could help expand the number of available tests. The US is now testing up to over 600,000 people per day, down from a peak of 850,000 daily tests last month many public health experts believe the country will soon need to test 
vastly more people to find out those infected. Isolate them and contain the virus. The FDA noted that Abbott's test could be used in doctor's office, emergency room, and some schools. Given the nature, the simple nature of the test, it's likely that these tests could be made broadly available which is a great again i think um you know what if you're a parent this will probably give you a lot of respite um i think for a school it's probably advantageous too because you're probably going to be able to afford this more so than having you know the actual full test done um you only need to kind of hire a health professional to kind of make it work and that's about it still a lot of money don't get me wrong but it's far better than the options that we had prior so yeah let's see what happens with that man i can't wait to see that on the market rather soon Beep, 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 beep. next on this what do we do and talk about here um let's maybe move ahead on to talking about maybe some event stuff because i thought this was quite interesting right where can i find it da, 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 da. yeah so here we go so patrick toping um a really well-known tech house dj that i'm not really of that much of a fan of i think he does some good productions here and there um but that you know that style of djing is not really my kind of thing but he's very popular in the uk they have a very big um following here tech house has exploded um in the uk in the last few years loads of new djs popping up all over the place loads of great music coming out from it loads of great parties and it's in general it seems like a pretty fun scene but there's a bit of snobbery in regards to the scene that i kind of put kind of um are situated in within the techno uh housey kind of via people maybe the kind of quote-unquote underground scene they kind of look at those guys as pariahs they kind of look at them as a little bit too fancy and stuff but i quite like looking and analyzing different areas of dance music and seeing what can apply to what we do in our scene and underground scene i think sometimes the level of professionalism that some of these guys approach djing with you can somehow you can maybe take elements of it and apply it to your own craft um i think the way they approach their gigs the showmanship could maybe be implemented with some djs right who are just kind of you know you only look at have to look at some of the live streams people do and just staring down at the mixer right they're not really engaging with the audience not providing any kind of fun time i don't know whatever it may be showmanship they're not doing any of that so parts of that stuff can be applied parts of the business um protocols and procedures could be applied to the way they market themselves could be applied in some way shape or form of course depending on your own taste and what you want to do but there are elements of these different industries and scenes i think um you can take lessons from and apply them to what you're doing and none more so than this review from mixmag regarding uh patrick toping doing a special social distancing rave gig thing in newcastle and, and I thought it was pretty impressive um, how he was able to put it together, um, the show itself, what they're able to offer, I think is going to shine a light on what we might see in the future in terms of live music events. Because we are obviously at a time, you know, where you're not able to go to regular raves as you were previously. Um, but I think this is going to last a lot longer than people expect. But I also think a lot of these practices and protocols that we have in place now, such as regular cleaning, right, having hand sanitizer available for free for people to use, are going to be things that are going to be implemented throughout for a long, a long period of time going forward to allow people to have the rest of the peace of mind in order to kind of know when they're coming to an event. And not going to catch anything untoward and i think one of the good examples of it are these little pod things right that they kind of feature in this picture i think they are going to end up being a really big staple with some of the more commercially minded festivals i don't know strawberries and cream um love box um all the other crazy things that happen at the olympic park you know those kind of like you know they're a bit corny you know, heavily promoting on social media festivals that book some of the more obvious tech house, deep house people. I think they're going to implement these pods because they're going to be a really good option to kind of upsell people on VIP tickets. VIP tickets, by and large, at festivals aren't really that worth they're not really worth the you know the price you pay yes you get access to an exclusive toilet and maybe a, a bar that you use on your own but apart from that they're a bit meh so if you're able to kind of give somebody a really uh bespoke experience at a festival at a gig that allows them to be in a little box on their own with their friends away from the crowd away from the regular paying folk or the brokies like myself i think those kind of customers will snap it up especially if you're able to have uh an on hand sort of like waiter waitress um helper maybe a little fridge in the corner even if you want to go extra you have like a little small row of toilets specifically for those pods um maybe with a little fob for each pod you use you slap in your thing and you go in i think it's going to be really 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 successful and it's going to make a lot of these promoters money and maybe again um allow for a different experience when you go into these sort of events and maybe for an older gentleman an older couple or somebody that's not really you don't want to have to you know get him you know because you don't want to have to rub shoulders with strangers all the stuff that i love about festivals right mucking around um getting in the mosh pit 
talking to random. Some people just don't want to do that. They just want to go, maybe have the ambience, be in the environment, but kind of be away from people. This is the perfect thing to do so. And again, it probably goes against everything that I would believe in in terms of dance music and in terms of underground culture and in terms of raving. But I still think we all occupy this kind of, we all occupy different areas, right? And we can all live harmoniously. We don't need to kind of fight each other and like throw stones. I think there are there is something that can be applied to it. So anyway, this is a review of the event. Review, Patrick Topping's uh, type of, sorry, I always use Topings at Joe Budden. Patrick Topping at the UK's first socially con uh, distanced dance event. So it says here, recently there's been uh, green shots of recovery in the barren landscape of 2020 for musicians and dancers following months in which artists and audience could not come together and dance safely. The world is slowly adapting to a degree of normality. Nature is healing, blah, blah, blah. Um, on Friday, Patrick Turpin was supported by Jaguar and Sally C for the UK's first arena socially distanced dance event on the Newcastle's outer reaches. While across Europe, illegal and legal parties, including tonight's headliner part playing in Italy last month, um, have sparked criticism about unsafe conditions. Turpin's team says they are only doing legal shows that are in line with any local restriction and regulations which again is something i've mentioned before it might be annoying some of these business techno guys going to play in italy and all these kind of places like malta and stuff but unfortunately they're they're, they're legally within their right to do so the governments have opened up the economy they've, they've given the promoters a green light to put an event on to boost the local economy so it makes sense that they want to go out and hire some of the bigger names to fill their arenas and their programs that they're putting on is it something that i'd want to do is it a message i want to send out there do i think it's um, sending a good message is it kind of putting the best foot forward is it allowing us to recover the best probably not but legally they have any right to do it it continues newcastle has found itself as a somewhat unlikely pioneer of gigging and clubbing in covid age with the launch of 2500 capacity virgin money um, unity arena which is a great idea and again i think goes to goes to show the kind of shift towards the shift away from the you know the bigger cities such as london where i am at and maybe into some maybe more localized events outside of london it says here um sam fender's debut show at the venue uh for through the week had been deemed a success but it's banned but his band of authentic authentic indie will be expected to be better suited to the conventional festival main stage and open air surroundings so i was interested to see how electronic music fared in comparison i'm not true you would have you'd assume sam fender would probably work better in indoors outdoors but hey house and techno have always technically thrived in the shadows with the atmosphere and intimacy of a club being um, complemented by the intensity of the sound system and strobe lighting this would definitely be different but i was confident that we would be enough pros to outweigh the cons given the circumstances the organizers played this close to perfection entry cues were non-existent the the pens used for the crowd segregations were clearly marked and spacious. The drinks were delivered to your booth. Amazing to prevent the crowding at the bar. So again, more table service type stuff. For some people, they wouldn't like it. But again, I think if you're a VIP customer and Lovebox offers you this for a £200 ticket or even Wireless Festival. Imagine they offer this at Wireless Festival. £200 ticket, you get to send Ciroc and bottles of champagne to your little thing or whatever. Not bottles because obviously they're going to smash them and probably um, stab some guy in the eye because it looks at you weird. But... If you're able to send drinks over to your uh, little ball pit, you've got the, obviously you've got the panache, the, the the social clout of being in a pit. Everyone knows how much they cost. And you also got the conveniency of being just on your own in a little group there. It's been perfect. I think for that customer, they would love it. At twenty two fifty a ticket, it was priced similarly to a normal large scale clubbing event. Uh, a black with a less uh, bulging lineup um, with some... Uh, which some will see as a positive many of the anxieties that typically have been uh have b before a night of clubbing were alleviated staggered entry times meant that the losing your group was near impossible and the social distancing eliminated any chance of being too hot or feeling claustrophobic with the focus being entirely on your mates and the music exactly and that's what we've seen from covid covid if anything has made us focusing on what really matters right do you remember the early stages of lockdown where we couldn't go out and meet our friends or go out and meet anyone outside of our own household that's when you realize oh crap i like my friends and family and the moment it was open and we were allowed to go out people started going to parks getting high getting smashed hanging around with their friends going to restaurants because they realized that outside of all the other you know fireworks the thing that actually you matters the most to you for the most part is the ability to meet your friends would have a drink grab a grab, grab a bite to eat and just hang out right that's what people are most having fun with people are in parks now victoria park london fields all these places with their mp3 player play, listen to music hanging out it's not the same as going to a nightclub but it's fun enough because you're with your friends so imagine that type of customer or imagine that type of person who's maybe has new habits now because again people are going to change for the for the better or for the worse their habits might change the, the things that they might accept might be different people might not be as more people might be people might not be as eager to go to a festival again 
in the same way, right? Huddled up next to each other, strangers left and right and hugging randoms and getting high and stuff. They might just want to be in their own little bubble for a prolonged period of time until things go back to complete normality. So this is perfect for it. I think it's really cool. Um, it definitely um, lines up with people's changing needs uh jagger opened and out on the stage then joined the crowd agrees he says i was in my area with my friends and it felt like we were at a proper festival hearing loud music in the field of a drinking half a fantastic imagine how that must feel oh so jealous it was also nice to have your own space with just about with just people you know around you it definitely was a positive if you're not going into big crowds and generally feels safer less claustrophobic and is way easier to get around there were still opportunities to mingle with your fellow ravers as you moved around the site but the night's priorities were certainly in the right place amazing and again if they do this and if they actually ramp up the production and get those massive jumbotrons like they did um for the travis scott show i, I, I went to in o2 and some of the stuff that sometimes they do at wireless when drake played that main stage they had these massive screens at our wall to wall right frame to fr yeah frame to frame with no borders around them see the the entire performance face that's going to be sick there's going to be no difference um i think in terms of festival in terms of festival experience they're usually used to again I think for normal festivals, you probably have a section where this would be maybe just at the front for the VIPs and then the rest of it would just be like, you know, everyone roaming around. But it definitely has a place within festival scene in some way, shape or form. Another picture here from the back. I'm guessing towards the back, they're sort of on a platform to allow people to see the stage, which makes complete sense. And maybe it's on a little bit of a slope anyway to make it a little bit easier. But I think that was a genius move. Um, it continues here. It says it's also worth noting that some of the female friends in attendance were especially pleased at how much more relaxed the evening was than normal coming experience. Ah, very true. I didn't think about that. The problems with people being harassed and groped in nightclubs are unfortunately well documented. And being so spaced out meant that there was far less chance of suffering and wanted attention. It's a shame that those problems still exist in the nightlife industry and it's taken a go pandemic um, for an inadvertent action preventing sexual harassment. But it's a silver lining with a large crowd. It's true because I'm showing you, I'm gonna show you a feed later from um Patrick Turpin who retweeted a lot of people were there and there's a lot of girls in like scantily clad outfits that are really showing out and I'm guessing a lot of it was to do with you know they haven't been out like bless girls nowadays right having your best outfit being in the best shape you have been in your life and then not being able to go out and show out in it right so when girls are going out they're going out to the max right you see how many the amount of girls I have my social media feed who get dressed up on Friday and be like I'm not going out anywhere in, in full glam is insane right girls need to show out and they need to show off their wares in some way shape or form so to have the ability to do so in a festival environment and be safe from any creep or pest that might come to your bullpen is amazing isn't it for away from the dance floor um, itself, uh, not a great deal had changed. The production and the lights and the sound were all impressive, as you'd expect from an event at the scale. And again, I mentioned about sound. I think because it's in Newcastle, they could ramp it up a bit. Uh, like I mentioned, apart from Junction 2, most London festivals, the sound is dog shit because of, you know, lights, um, noise pollution laws and council stuff and all that malarkey. So they're always having to put a limiter on it and kind of dim the sound somewhat. And it's just really, really crap. Or just the production in general is not that great. Junction 2 is probably the only festival I've been to in my life in London that's been great uh, but everyone always told me that if you go to a festival outside of london the sound is always that high anyway it's just a standard thing so i think maybe it's just a london thing because it's just a densely populated city some councils are a bit tight in terms of how the sound is and you know there's a lot of flipping uk karens here that just don't like people having fun a quote here it says it felt amazing to be back on stage playing music through a big sound system um despite everyone being scattered in the designated areas i was still able to connect with people who are vibing to the music said jaguar it's a different experience to playing to people uh mass together but it gave me a buzz that i've missed for the past six months it feels like it could be the future of how we do dance music <laughs> i miss it too I'm, i miss djing as much as i miss going out djing is only fun when you're out with people i've done a few live streams i've got a couple of coming up actually i'm gonna promote on here actually so d definitely keep an eye out for that of my dj live streams i'm gonna be doing that i'm gonna be doing live from pirate studios in dawson so definitely um keep an eye out for those ones if you're available on youtube and on twitch but it's more fun with randoms it's more fun in front of a f it's front of strangers it's more fun when it's a gig paid or not paid like it's more fun that way man so i can only imagine if you're like a full-time dj professional dj not having this experience uh, must be awful but just being in a rave itself is something i'm missing man continue so saying that she said i do miss the energy of big crowds give off when you're djing out i miss bodies moving and cheering roaring in unison i also miss that excitement and curiosity of being free to roam around and chat to new people and make new friends i can't wait until that day we get back but this is the best we can do for now which i agree and this is a at least something right it's sanitized it's a bit safe um it's a little bit corporate i know whatever say what you're gonna say but there is some hope 
that we're going to get back to where we can get to if something like this is going on, right? Personally, for me, I'd rather wait. I wouldn't go something like this, but I definitely see the appeal of these kind of events. One thing Patrick Turpin trick imprint has managed to do particularly well is nail down an aesthetic on the stage design and videography. The visuals behind the DJ booth are spectacular and fit Patrick Turpin's own brand of sizzly tech house perfectly. Uh, Patrick didn't delve too far into his own back catalogue, reaching from more recent tracks such as B Sharp, Stay Now, uh, sorry, B Sharp, Stay Now, and Turbo Time. But the set had a nice flow and kept um, Turbo Time's actually a good track. Um, it kept the dance floor moving. Um, there was a note to the previous night's performances as he dropped his own remix of Fan Surrender's Hypersonic Miss which received a raucous reaction it marks a change in pace from the more distorted uh, duh. there's also plenty of presumably unreleased bangers it said it was well, it's just him talking right he said it was so good i'm buzzing off it um it wasn't even that much different for me as a crowd were up for it the 2500 people who were there were so happy to finally be at an event that um they were really went for it and made it a class vibe said toping the security and promoters said it went really well from a safety point of view so it couldn't ask for more and i guess for money as well because he's not having to front the whole cost i think that's what Burt Crash is talking about of his driving things where you're having to basically front the cost for the entire production but I guess if Virgin are doing it in collaboration with promoters they probably give promoters or big promoters certain dates and then they fill it up with a lineup so you're kind of offsetting the cost of it there's not a, offsetting the risk as well it's a pre you know again it's, you've kind of proved the concept with two successful shows it kind of is a great idea was that, was that a Burberry tracksuit? Jokes. is that Burberry? it isn't right yeah Nice. Um, Patrick's set was slick. The mixing was dexterous and the track section was on point. Cringe. But the undoubted highlight of the night was a surprise special guest. With 30 minutes of remaining, Patrick took the mic to welcome another Northeast icon, MC Stomping. Name lit up across the LED screens and a field new cards collectively lost their mind. I don't know who MC Stomping is. Um, it was a bold move, but it's not entirely unexpected. Patrick Lonson's champion and music of his youth and consistently provided a platform for one genre, um, and that would be his own. Makina, the hardcore tech house hybrid, also known as the new monkey, definitely isn't for everyone in terms of flow. He said, duh, duh, duh. okay, that's MC Stomping there. But yeah, it looks cool. It looks great, isn't it, right? And then look at the videos. The videos look even more impressive, man. And I, honestly, I think it's a good option going forward. Not for everybody, like I mentioned, I think I don't think everyone's going to be down for it i think if you're a grease muller bergheim um alibi default exo wire uh smart bar uh the school uh <laughs> i don't know same heads kind of person um the cause you're not gonna like this you're not gonna like this at, at all but i think if you don't mind going to a, an event just to go see your favorite dj player like more commercial ones like right? even the people that i like um like the jamie jones the seth chocolers um the martinez brothers is the luca the loco dice i can imagine doing those sort of things i think it's a good option so this is this is from his this is from his uh social media feed playing some videos of the event and it looks pretty fun i'm not gonna lie it looks pretty fun again not for me but it looks pretty fun <laughs> It's a drop. That's fun, man. You can't tell me that's not fun. Especially being all at home all this time. It's just giving me goosebumps already just hearing that kind of that level of noise, man. God damn it, man. Let's see more videos here. What else has got? No, oh, it's a retweet to the same video. People that, re people that retweet compliments of the same video. Oh, that's annoying. But yeah, good pictures here. Go again. Come on. More. Yep, it's another one. Let's see. This is produced by a virgin, right? Let's see what this looks like. <laughs> Yee! That was fun, man. You can't. You can't tell me that doesn't look fun. That looks fun. Come on, the lights, everything that's going on there. That looks fun, doesn't it? Come on. Like, how long have you? When's the last time you've been outdoors at night dancing? Like, <laughs> when? Maybe you go to a local park, you go to like a warehouse thing. Like, when's the last time you legitimately been out? Like, it just feels. That's why sometimes you see. You know, sometimes I, 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 when I want to find new tunes, I'd go online and I'd look for like a DJ that I like and I'd kind of go on YouTube. This is prior to Instagram and I'd kind of search via the up, last uploaded. 
and you'd see an event that happened maybe in 1999 that's been uploaded recently but i skip now you can legitimately look at videos from like december and be like wow that feels like ages ago you don't even recognize that world anymore people swaying left and right dancing going crazy it doesn't even make any sense <coughs> so if they're providing some kind of option with this i can see people taking it up again the more commercially minded people i can see even someone like um what, what what's that group what's that thing called um circle loco right i can see them doing this kind of event easily they would easily do this right they just would be you know they've got a crowd that would eat this up so yeah don't don't be surprised if you see more uh people taking this up Nah, that, that looks like fun, man. I'm, I'm fucking jealous. I am so jealous. And I think it's got some more pictures of other people as well that actually attended the event. Let me see if I can continue scrolling down here. Uh, more compliment, retweeting compliments, which is always annoying on Twitter because you never get to the actual core of the thing. Ay, ay, ay. But, you know, he has to show it proved. Show and prove that it actually worked. Okay, it's a girl's picture. Yeah, this is, good. this is one that shows it. Um, I think you see a bit of it too. This young lady... <laughs> I know it's great, man. I'm not bad at that at all. Loads of groups of young girls feeling safe to hang around, where they where they're scantily clad outfits without you know without creepos coming next to them. The worst you're gonna get is some weird eyes, but apart from that, you're pretty safe. And look how loud it is as well. There's so much great sound. Ooh, that good bicep, man. That legendary bicep, man. Oh. God almighty, I miss going out. <laughs> Don't get me going. Tech, going. I think going out to Tech House Rave sort of stuff is a bit, you know, it's a bit boring because it's, a, it's the same monotonous sort of like beat style, but it does look like fun. We can't deny it. And you can see the entire thing because I guess they're on they're all on different slopes. They they're kind of like um ascending sort of level, um all the platforms. Man, that looks fucking fun. I don't care. That looks fun. That looks really fun. That looks really fun. Shaky video. I'm not gonna watch that one. It's gonna give me an eye ache. All good. That's class, man. I don't care. That's really fun. That looks like a good time, a good night out. Look at it. See, look. Someone's even got a little bit of a nipple out there, I think, in that one. Yeah, see? It's a fun time, man. Like a fun, fun time. Fun time. Again, I, I can't wait to see it. You've seen loads of groups of girls actually post some pictures. So I'm assuming it kind of um, was a success. They sold out all the tickets. And yeah, hopefully we see more of these events going forward. But yeah, let me know. Would you go to this event? Would you go to a social distance event? Again, maybe not those kind of DJs. Maybe a DJ of your taste of your style would you go to this sort of event or would you rather wait out until you're able to go to an actual dark dingy underground basement party warehouse rave somewhere similar to like a burger on the fold like there's no in between for you you'd rather not go to open anything you want to go to your actual rave 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 let me know in the comments down below what you think i'd love to hear your thoughts let's end with a couple more here before we leave <laughs> Oh, so um, update on Megan The Stallion. Should we mention that one? Yeah, a little update on that one. Yeah, yeah. Why not? Let's update on Megan The Stallion because you know, I think I've mentioned that a few times on here, and I think it's only fair that I kind of round up that bit of news. But um, a story. It's an odd one, isn't it? This Megan The Stallion thing because it it keeps changing, it keeps morphing into other things, and I guess at the heart of it, really, a young lady was involved in a very violent altercation it seems like for the most part um and she got hurt there's no way we can doubt that's not true um and it shouldn't happen right it just shouldn't happen a young lady shouldn't be no one should be pulling a gun out on a young woman whatsoever um especially during some sort of heated argument you should be having an argument with the person and you should be maybe going on your separate ways but there should be no occasions where pulling a gun out on a woman makes sense unless they're obviously trying to kill you right um you're involved in some kind of frenzied attack and they're about to pull a knife out on your throat. And, you know, you have to defend yourself in any way, shape, or form you can. So we all agree it shouldn't have happened. Megan Stallion shouldn't have been shot in any way, shape, or form. But I guess 
The issue at hand is that the details of the story sound a bit flaky and the accusation that she put out there that she got shot in two feet with bullets just doesn't add up if you look at all the evidence that's gone out there. And it's a bit annoying because I think it's quite clear to me so far from the evidence that we got out there and from what we've heard via the LA Times and other sources that she didn't get shot directly in the foot. She might have been hit um, with fragments, with shrapnel um, from a bullet that hit something else, but she wasn't shot directly in both feet as she claimed in the video. She was maybe hit in one foot that was obviously bleeding, hence the video we saw of her kind of limping out of the car when the police um, stopped the car that Tori and her were driving. But she wasn't shot in directly in both feet. And it's annoying because I think the actual story is still bad. Even if Tori got so irate with her that he shot to the ground and it ricocheted and hit her foot, it doesn't matter. It's still unacceptable. You shouldn't be doing that to a woman. He still, his career would still would have still been cancelled. He still would have a lot to answer for himself for. And if he didn't, his career would be cancelled regardless anyway. Um, and, you know, we should try our best to protect all women in those situations, for sure. But to lie about it and to purposely embellish the story or to purposely leave out certain segments of it makes me, again, makes me think of the original issue that Megan kind of came into limelight with was the story concerning her original record label, right? Where she sort of painted the story that she was being held at gunpoint or that she signed a contract um, under false pretenses. And then when the contract details were leaked to the media or leaked to the public, we then saw that the contract was just a standard 360 shitty deal that every musician gets when they first enter the scene or enter the industry. But because Megan Thee Stallion is one of the rare artists within the hip hop that comes in, because it's, it's happens to a few people, you get bestowed as the new, as the next one. There's certain people that have that kind of blessing. Cardi B had it when she first came in, right? As a new artist, she's kind of got the blessing and the benefit and the looks that more, that kind of gives you the impression that she's kind of been positioned to be the next one coming up. So of course, with that, you see the money coming into your account or you see the opportunity of deals that are coming in and you see the cut that your label's taking and it starts to really you know shake you at your core it starts to fuck you know it doesn't sit right with your spirit as they say on black twitter so i'm sure that's what happened she probably saw it and said oh hold on my contract all fucked up and then in an effort to kind of get out of her deal she decided to make up the story about her being signed under false pretenses make it seem as if her original record label had basically um scammed her in some way shape or form when that wasn't the case she just got a shitty deal like everyone else does um and then that's that's case is still wrangling on we don't really know if it actually got concluded it may have got concluded but that kind of really made me think okay she's doing this you know that's that's something you've done on purpose you've obviously you know what the truth is but you want to paint it one way to get out of your deal fair but then to do this to tory isn't fair because i think the actual story is bad enough as it is right he still did something with the gun that made your feet bleed but he didn't shoot you directly in the foot because it's impossible for you to be shot in both feet and to be hanging around in bars and clubs everyone knows the foot's got the most bones in your body for it to pass through both feet without touching any bones or any kind of you know um tendons is crazy for it to pass through one maybe but both is just insane um then megan obviously felt the pressure online with people kind of calling scorn on her story calling her liar um which i think is a bit of a stretch i think she might have maybe uh, embellished the truth because she's a bit angry at the person that she was involved in romantically where people can get a bit you know bitter and all that sort of stuff i'm sure that's what happened i'm sure she's not a pathological liar but she felt the pressure. She released a picture of a foot injury, then deleted it. But from the foot injury picture that we saw, and based on some of the information that we got online, it does kind of marry up to the story that it probably was shrapnel. And based on the story that has now been leaked from the LA Times, or reported from the LA Times, we're now getting word that they're not investigating it as a shooting in general anyway. So let's read the article. It says here, Megan Thee Stallion had the gunshot wound needing surgery after um, Tory Lanez shot her. She says after Tory shot her. So this is from... August the 22nd, says the following. Megan Thee Stallion underwent surgery for a gunshot wound and shrapnel was removed from her left heel in the hours after she said she was shot in Hollywood Hills last month. More details of the incident emerged Friday, a day after the Stallion for the first time through her Instagram live account said that her fellow hip-hop star pulled the trigger that left her wounded on July the 2nd, the 12th, sorry. Which is interesting to me because she's finally named him and I always, I've always argued that I don't think black people get cancelled. We just don't. I think it took decades for R. Kelly to go into prison. It took years. It took even more for Bill Cosby to finally get brought to justice, even though everybody in the scene and knew what he was doing, um, if you believe what you read online. So I think Troy Lenz could probably, um, you know, could probably bounce back from this. Unfortunately so, or fortunately so, depending on where you sit with the cancel culture conversation. An even recent example is a 
Chris Brown issue. Usually back in the day, if you hit a woman, especially in Hollywood, if you weren't black, your career is completely over with. Um, the fact that he was able to kind of bounce back from that says a lot about the industry too. I just don't think people are going to cancel him to an extent that people are thinking he's going to cancel to, in my opinion, even though he's been named uh, by um, Megan. Medical records now in possession of authorities show that the rapper, who was born Megan Pete, underwent surgical procedure to remove a thrown object from her heel after she was shooting. She had a four centimeter, four centimeter wound she recorded. A thrown object isn't a bullet. If it's a bullet, they say it's a bullet. So that's the first issue. The WAP and Savage rapper was treated at the Cedar Sinai Medical Center. She reported she felt pain in both feet, though. Um, with the Los Angeles County District Attorney Office considering whether to file felony assault charges with a firearm against Lane, Stallion said it was time for him to admit to shooting her. She said, as I quote, Yes, Tori, shot me. You shot me. You got your publicist and your people to go around these blogs lying. Stop lying. Why lie? I don't understand. That's not true. I don't think Tori's doing that. I don't think it's within his interest to get his publicist to try and clear his name via the blogs. If anything, you want to clear your name in a court of law. The blogs are the worst places to go and defend yourself, especially most of the blogs are heavily female leaning, female favored, or, you know, in terms of the arguments that they get involved in, in terms of how they cover, you know, domestic disputes, they tend to usually favor the woman in the argument so it's the worst place for him to defend himself if anything i think the commentators and the other independent um meme pages and bloggers such as the one i follow like mob radio she does some really good work um they've already been questioning the story from the onset because it or i think some of them already have a bit of an issue with megan to begin with don't get me wrong but i think as the stories panned out and how it was kind of being reported it just didn't seem like what she said happened happened so i think the commentators were ones that kind of led um, the scrutiny behind the story because I think anybody else that got involved in this who probably was maybe more university liked they wouldn't probably had such um, skepticism put against their story probably probably would have probably would have just believed it and moved on. It's a continuous here. It says she acknowledged that when police first responded to the report of a shooting and found the two recording artists outside the SUV, she did not tell the responding officer she had been shot because she was afraid the legal repercussions and afraid for her safety, which is odd because you'd imagine if you're a police officer, you could probably ascertain what a bullet wound is. Again, you're not a doctor. I understand that or a medical professional, but you've probably got enough experience on the on the streets to know what a bullet wound look like if you're an officer in it. But it continues, it says, I didn't tell the police nothing because I didn't want us to get in trouble. She said in a video um she also said that she wanted to spare lanes of trouble and did not explain how she was injured initially she told officials that she thought that she was glass cut and not realizing the nature of the wound she was barefoot at the time of the incident after a night of partying uh, lanes was arrested on suspicion of possession of a concealed weapon after the vehicle was um he was stopped at lapd the video from the scene showed lanes and uh and stallion uh, limping barefoot lanes real name was daystar peterson was released on bail LA County prosecutors on July 24th received a felony assault with firearm investigation from LAPD but sent it back for further investigation. The 28-year-old rapper was not made any statements about the incident but Stallion and her comments in her comments said she believed these publicists and people had been lying about the incident to deflect blame. Stallion's her uh, Stallion her friend lanes a security guard with an SUV after the party um, at a house owned by Kylie Jenner in the early hours of July 12th when the female rapper from Houston said the argument erupted and she decided she had enough to go out and walk away. She said she was um, minutes from the house she was staying in. She then realized that she, as she was walking away, a fellow artist fired at her from the back seat. You shot me. I didn't cut my glass back and tell you why they're saying that. It's funny they finally mentioned Kylie Jenner's name. They haven't mentioned it at all in the arguments because I think the original story we have from Adam 22 was supposedly Kylie and Tori were hitting it off or something or along those lines. Megan saw that, got annoyed. They go into an argument. Kylie didn't ask them to leave her home because you know they're causing a scene, and then the argument spilled out into the SUV, hence the shooting. But we don't know if that's part of it. It's true, and if it is true, she's you know cooperating with this. She played some role in this, but when you're at that level of fame and that level of uh, um, net worth, you, you just don't get involved in some sort of some things. You just don't get involved in, and it is what it is. On the night of July, LA officers um, swarmed the 180 block of the Nicholas Canyon about 4.30 a.m. after receiving a report of gunfire. According to LAPD, the witnesses of the incident provided a description of the suspect and their vehicle. Officers stopped the uh, vehicle, matched the description, detained mutual people, and eventually arrested Lanes, according to a statement. In a video of the aftermath, both Lanes and, Stal and Stalin can be seen in handcuffs as officers tried to determine what happened. Without naming the female rapidly, LAPD said one person was taken to hospital with a foot injury. Again, 
Nothing about bullet wound. Stanley, in the aftermath, repeatedly said that she had expected a full recovery, but said in the subsequent post about um, that the shooting and the subsequent surgery was super scary and the worst experience of her life. She felt blessed um, that the gunfire hit where it did on Wednesday. Stanley and posted and then deleted an image on Instagram that said she'd shown a result of being shot. Why would I lie about being shot? Stanley said in a blunt post in response to the comment she said she underwent. She had um, until Thursday avoided naming lanes as a salient, even in the interviews, but then she accused him of lying to come up with an episode accused him of getting aliases on social media to drag her down okay maybe that's true i'm not too sure if that is but i would think in my opinion if i was involved in some kind of domestic dispute um with a female the worst place i'd go and try and defend myself is a shade room comments like you know it's just not the place for men to try and fight their corner in that regard um i just think people have questions man i don't think the story matches up i don't think the story makes sense um this is back more so more so because of what she said if megan wasn't so quick to come out and say what happened i think people would have just like let the story get dealt with in the courts and whatever information we got fed via the press we got fed but because she's on social media reading comments again agitated by people kind of calling her a liar she wants to respond and kind of fight back and she does come across a little bit too angry a little bit too hot-headed a little, a little bit too um yeah she just, just she just comes comes just a bit too angry like you know why would i lie it's like everybody lies people lie all the time about nonsense things it's, there's you no know, we don't know why you'd lie you are you we are us um so the lie can happen we don't know um again she said she got shot in both feet so far the evidence proves that she didn't get shot in both feet maybe one and if that if if and people no one's saying anything about a bullet they're talking about a foreign object landed in her foot and for me i just don't know why she'd need to lie like the story already is bad enough even if it is shrapnel Tory lane's career should be cancelled he should be on hold he should be you know in rehab whatever um immediately his deals are going to be you know completely wiped off the table uh, probably as they have done already um but i think for the most part people are probably waiting until the actual verdict from the courts but um the story is bad enough as it is no need to actually embellish it even more but again you know i don't know what happens with people in hollywood maybe again there's love involved you get a bit angry i'm not sure in situation but i'd love to hear the actual story i'd love to hear what kylie jenner's role played in it in regards to it and maybe we'll hear tory lane's side of things later on as well we never know but yeah what let me know in the comments what do you think do you think she's lying do you think she's telling the truth does it matter if she's lying is tory crane's tory lane's career over or not let me know down below da, 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 da. what else we got here Oh god, let's, let's end with this one. So it's a funny video. This is from um Sam Tripoli, right? Uh, who's now hosting a show with uh Brian Callen, who I'm sure you guys are more familiar with. Um, if you've kind of been a fan of my show and subscribed recently, you know I've been covering all the drama concerning Brian Callen's recent sexual assault allegations and the uh, um the drama that kind of you know happened with these podcasts and cast media and all that sort of good stuff. Well, as you know, he's got a lot of support via Patreon. Um, they launched a Patreon for, and, uh, whoops. You yeah, know, I mean. They launched a Patreon. Yeah, so let's go back. So Sam Tripoli, as you guys are aware, is um, now Brian Callen's de facto co-host on a podcast they have via Patreon. They launched their Patreon back on the back of the Brian Callen allegations. Um, Brian Callen was essentially kicked off or removed himself from his own podcast, The Fire and the Kid. Patreon donations came in supporting Brian Callen in the hopes that they're going to do their own podcast called The Fire and the Rinks, that they're going to do behind a paywall. Cast Media, the production company, or the real bosses of The Fire and the Kid stepped in and said, Hey, no Callen on the podcast. No sponsor's going to want to do a show with you guys, with him associated with it. They rebranded it as a show with Brandon Shaw with other co hosts. It's now going down in flames for the most part. The recent episodes are being downvoted to hell. I'm not sure if it's mostly the homeless cats doing it off it's actually fans but if you look at the comments look at actual fans of the show just miss having Callan on there and are not fans of Josh Wolf's Josh Wolf's um, ex, um, enthusiastic laughter let's say that for the most part <clears throat> But the Sam Tripoli show has been, you know, there's been a bit of a Luke response from people so far, right? Because he has a particular, you have to be a fan of Sam Tripoli to be a fan of that show, right? He's got a, he has a certain appeal. But what I do like about Sam Tripoli is that he he does shoot from the hip, right? He does kind of say it as it is because he's a little bit crazy and because he's a conspiracy theorist, he does tend to kind of question everything and maybe see the bigger picture and things. 
And if ever there was a time to see the bigger picture, it was now during this whole episode of takedowns within the LA comedy scene. This is the moment to really kind of call things as you see it and not as they're being presented to you. And Sam Tripoli went on this really amazing rant on the podcast. I'm not sure what podcast this was, but it's a little clip that I found online um, where he basically pulls a lid or pulls a curtain back on Hollywood and what's kind of really going on with the LA comedy scene and just eviscerates them from beginning to end. I'm going to play uh, the clip for you now and comment on the other side. And, uh, you know, I mean, wow. What do you think of, uh, we talked about earlier, but I'd love to get your take on cuties. Oh, you kidding me? I mean, even though you look like the guy that did the casting for it. uh, (laughs) I'll take it. (laughs) I mean, it's absolutely fucking what a joke. What Netflix has done this month. You know, I thought it was bad that they gave Rob Schneider a special, but then they go and they. Sarah Cooper. Sexualize children. (laughs) Oh, well, first of all. Chris D'Elia gets accused of uh, all this shit, shows evidence that that didn't happen. They still drop him, but they're like, we're getting rid of Chris because the accusations, but to make up for, we got all 11-year-olds twerking. Right. I mean, yeah. it's like the hypocrisy yeah. is unbelievable. It's 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 unbelievable. They 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 just made especially with cuties as well because I think the assumption is that it's a French film made by a Sudanese woman. So you're uh, so you are. It's fair to assume if this movie was made by somebody that looks like a Karen, it wouldn't have got the benefit of the doubt that it had got recently uh, via the press. And because it was made by a person of colour, it got a standing ovation at the Sundance Film Festival, which makes no sense, right? Sundance Film Festival still flipping invites, um, what's his name? Roman Polanski to premiere some of his films, right? A convicted sexual offender who ran away to France to evade capture in the US. They still invite him there. So using the Sundance is like an excuse. There's no excuse. <laughs> New Chris, they made new Chris D'Elia's by putting that out there. Uh, you know, it is what it is, but you know, bunch it, of people out there trying to DM these stars of cuties right, right now. <laughs> oh, and I bet you they have a social media. Who did these, these chicks? Girls? These eleven-year-old girls. I bet you you can follow them. You can tweet them. I I guarantee it. Like I love how talk. they're like, it's French. Oh well, it's French then. Just uh, <laughs> put, let's see some fucking yeah. eleven-year-old so bee holes. Exactly. Stinky eleven-year-olds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Why are we talking about this when we could be talking about the crime that is Sarah Cooper and her fucking Netflix special? I don't I care, mean, dude. Yeah, that's done, a, though? That's dude, a hard... don't you understand? It's, it's... That is just the death fucking... That's just the fucking nail in the coffin. Because you know what happened, dude? All the rats at, at Viacom have all went over to Netflix, yep. and they're doing the exact right. same yep. thing. They're running into the ground. So yep. what's going to be the next one, then? What's Independent. Gonna next, like, Everything's going to go decentralized, dude. Yeah. People are going to like, dude, people are going to be like, I'm tired of this because no matter what blows up, they come in and buy it and right. they pervert it. Yeah. So the same thing happens with YouTube, right? YouTube is effectively turned into a major network platform. Most of the videos on trending are made by big budget production companies, really sanitized YouTube creators. But the actual essence of youtube has been lost because they're chasing network dollars they want ad revenue um they've essentially sold their soul to hollywood for the most part and unfortunately smaller independent creators such as myself and other people are the ones that suffer the most and it's sad because it happens cyclically it's just, it always happens like this netflix was a platform where they could have you know used it to basically shine a light on maybe the more unrecognized stand-ups right give them a bit of a platform to magnify their voice and then it suddenly got to a point where they had to make an internal investment and now they're you know essentially got all the big dogs there Seinfeld's gonna have a special there Chappelle Chris Rock plus all the, everybody else underneath them then they've got the Sarah Cooper lady who does those weird mimes of Donald Trump right which is very bizarre I watched a couple of her stand up she's a pretty funny girl her actual stand-up is pretty good but the memes or the little mimings of Donald Trump is very bizarre. I don't know why that's funny. It makes absolutely no sense. And now she's got a comedy special, which is probably going to... I'm assuming it's going to be good. To be fair, I don't think... I'm not going to be hating it as much. I think it's going to be a pretty good, interesting improv show. But it just shows, you know, somebody that has probably not as many credits or much experience in the industry as these guys sitting around this table has suddenly leapfrogged because she happens to catch the zeitgeist. guys. She's a person of color. Um, she's talking about Trump where everyone seems to hate Orange Man bad and then you suddenly get a Showtime, you suddenly get a Netflix special. And that's the issue. It's like, you know, there's, it just gets overpopulated with that type of person. It's not that you give that person the opportunity, it's that you don't also give the person coming up who isn't doing that the chance to. It's just you you kind of put your eggs all in the basket of the sanitized um, version of what you want to put out instead of introducing some of the other underground acts. 
It needs to be every everybody's got to be putting out their own shit, yeah. doing their own thing. I'm done. I like, dude. What happened to this comedy scene? I am over LA comedy. Nice. I am not gonna uh, Rudolph. I'm not even gonna try to play in the reindeer games anymore. I don't give a fuck Shout about all Netflix. these phony fucks exactly. who celebrated all these dudes getting taken down. Amy Schumer. And, like, dude. Chris, I'm not, like, to Whitney Carl, Cummins. I have nothing against it, but her taking Chris D'Elia's role is exactly what they want. Exactly. Which is get rid of the alphas and put in these fucking sacred betas. And they, it's not about right or wrong. It's about taking your job and eliminating the competition. That's what this is all about. Exactly. And all these fucking people, these blue checkmark people, celebrating this shit, I'm fucking done with it. And I watched who it was. And I know who they are. And I know what they fucking participate in. I'm over all of them. I'm and, a- that, and that's the interesting part as well. Think about it. If you're in the LA comedy scene, like, not to put, you know, smart on anyone's name, but how could you legitimately be comfortable talking your shit, you know, as comedians do, being loose, being funny, trying to court controversy, trying to get a reaction from people and just trying to say some wild shit around people like Whitney Cummings, around people like Amy Schumer. How would you be comfortable? You can't be comfortable because you've seen what they did to their own actual friends in Brian Callen and Crystal Lee, how they threw them under the bus or how they purposely um, um, purposely refused to mention them by name or to stand up for them or to say anything meaningful in terms of their friendship or to kind of reflect on them. Because imagine, think about it as well, right? Mate, um, what's his name? Quentin Tarantino, right? Once when Harvey Weinstein allegations were rampant, Harvey Weinstein drugged women, raped them against their will, right? Used his power and his influence to control, manipulate, harass, and degrade women all over the park, right? Not even just Hollywood people, like uh, 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 um, house assistants, uh, maids, everybody got it, right? This guy was a monster, an absolute heinous monster. But. He was also very influential and very instrumental in the success of Quentin Tarantino. So when Quentin Tarantino was asked the question, this is a quintessential monster everyone hates. Yeah, you could come out and just say, I don't know the guy, I wish death on his family, bury him, bury him, bury him, bury him under the prison, whatever. He was asked, what do you think about the issues going on with um, uh, Harvey Weinstein? And to paraphrase, Quentin Tarantino said, he is my friend, so I'm going to refrain from saying anything now. Obviously, the, what he's been accused of is disgusting, but he's been a good friend to me, so I'm not going to go out and go out and limb and say what I'm going to say. I'm going to wait for things to kind of develop, and then I'll give my comment. Even Quentin Tarantino, whose friend happens to be Harvey Weinstein, who you can you can legit argue that Quentin Tarantino probably didn't see what Harvey Weinstein was getting up to. He might have heard it in the background, but being a big of a star as he is, I'm sure Harvey Weinstein, being the master manipulator there is, presented one face to Quentin and one face to everybody else. So Quentin Tarantino, even in that instance, said, I refuse to comment. This guy's my friend. I refuse to comment. He's my friend. Harvey Weinstein. And these motherfuckers, it's only fucking Chris it's a It's a pretty wishy-washy accusation, right? Even if it is true... You can still stand by the guy and say, I'm going to help him out. I'm going to go with him in rehab, blah, 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 whatever. No. They throw him under the bus, pretend they don't know the guy. In Brian Callen's case, Chris D'Elia, he deleted all these fucking images of him on his social feed. Uh, Whitney Cummins deleted all the shows with her and D'Elia because she didn't want to be incriminated in the issue. It's absolutely disgusting, mate. So how can you be... F- imagine being a comedian and being around these people knowing that they sold out one of your fellow pe- like comedic peers. Again, you don't have to be fans of their work, but how does that make you feel? Knowing that these people, if it comes push to shove and you have to choose between Hollywood and your scene as a comedian or the, you know, um, what do they call it? The comedy family, they're going to pick Hollywood. And unfortunately for them too, it's a bad choice because eventually if you do something untoward, Hollywood's going to eat you and you're going to be left with no friends. I'm a pirate, dude. Butt pirate? That, that's for butt pirate. pirate. I'm a pirate, <laughs> yeah, bottom, okay? Bottom. And I have a fucking pirate ship, and I don't want to be in any of your projects, and I don't want to work with any of you. You're all scumbags. Exactly. You're fucking, you, you let two, uh, Brian Gallon's the nicest dude in the world. Exactly. And you all let that shit go down gleefully. Exactly. Gleefully. Exactly. You're talking about LA comedians? I'm talking about all these LA comics exactly. that I saw with the blue check marks. But not, actually, but not comedy store people. Yeah, no, of course. there are some comedy store people. Winnie Cummings, very much so. Hmm. And I can't wait to watch them at the comedy store act like they. I, I don't know what the fuck they did. I know exactly what the fuck wanna, they did. I want to talk with you about this off the air. This is exciting. I'm over this shit, dude. You're, I don't want anything to do with you guys. You're, so, you're all selling your soul. In five years, you're gonna be like, "What did I do with my life? Yeah. I didn't make an honest human connection with anybody." 
I fucking thought my IMDB was important. And guess what? Johnny Carson was the biggest star in the world. Nobody talks about that motherfucker right now. Nobody. So all the shit you give a fuck about is going to mean nothing. And Boom. You, all you're going to be known as is a rat who Boom. fucking sold out everybody around them. Drop a bomb and I on can't that. wait to laugh at when your corpse is burning on the side of the fucking road, dude. Boom! Sam Tripoli. Absolute legend. Absolutely. And he's true. He's right. He's absolutely right. And I think... If anything, that's the beauty of COVID and being under lockdown, especially if you live in Hollywood, because that machine, that juggernaut, is is it came to a grinding halt. All jobs, all opportunities, all shows, all writing gigs stopped, ended. You had to kind of make your own thing, put on your own shows, start your own live streams, your own podcasts, whatever it may be. You had to ramp up your social media um, content game. You had to rely on yourself. And I think from that experience, just even a little traction you get, a little bunch, a little uh, viewership, uh, some little money coming in is going to show you, hey, actually, I don't need to do the stuff I did prior. I don't need to be holding the hand of Hollywood, hoping them to walk me through the door. I can do it on my own. And you also know that you can be location independent because you don't need to be in LA now to be a successful comedian. You can have your, I, I look at, I think people should do the model of a Tim Dillon, right? Tim Dillon has effectively been able to build his community like from the ground up, essentially. Now he's got a patron like in the 50,000s per month, right? Um, he's been able to build it to a point where he can just go around, book gigs in certain locations, do a month or do a residency there, uh, go on road for six months and then come back. He doesn't need to be at a particular store or a particular comedy club week in, week out anymore because he has a fan base of people that are going to come sell out his shows again and again and again. And I think that's the, that's the, that's the kind of... Um, more that people should be following going forward all creative fields i think of course it's, it's unfortunate that most of this has come off the back of um an, a, allegations against some of their peers people getting counseled or whatever it may be but i think it's always an opportunity to kind of review how you are conducting yourself in the industry and again i think if you're whitney cummins you're amy schumer you're these kind of people who are you know amy schumer the other day was talking about some black lives matter thing right she was on the panel talking about how we can come back police brutality which is insane she's already picked her lane she's going down the activism role um amy um whitney cummins is probably doing the same thing too she's obviously decided that she's gonna bet her she's gonna put her chips in the hollywood scene more so because i guess she's a writer and she develops shows so she sees more opportunity that way in terms of hanging around with dusty la comedian male guys which i understand but i think in terms of um the long game for sure you're more likely to get eaten or to get dashed to the side on a scrap heap by hollywood as opposed to doing your own thing of course whitney she's got a great podcast now and that's going good where it needs to be but the signs it's sending that you're so willing and able to kind of throw your friend under the bus it doesn't really bode well for you in the future especially with how things are going forward and um, people want transparency people want honesty people want people they can connect to and i think this has probably done a lot more damage to her reputation and image with fans in general i think even for someone like myself who was actual fan of her neurotic kind of self um, um, then she probably has realized and um i don't know man i just think this is kind of the new future the new future is going to be independent content creators creating their own little world um inviting their fans to it um that talk direct directly talking to their fans right it's a whole method it's a whole ideology behind 1000 true fans um and that's it and then taking it from there but you don't need to be and again unless you want to be kevin hart you don't need hollywood you really don't it doesn't make any sense um especially when that you rely on it to the extent where if the industry stops you're then having to make because i think that's part of the reason why a lot of these artists started doing those weird videos that imagine stuff because they just were bored at home and they needed some sort of outlet i think that's a major reason why it happened um so if you have an outlet doing a podcasting stream, doing a show on Patreon, live streams, you're doing your own shows, you upload onto Instagram, you do Q&As, all this sort of good stuff, you're going to be completely fine. And I guess, um, like I said, um, what Sam Trippi said it was true. Only he could say it because, again, being conspiracy theorist, he sees things for what they are and whatnot they're trying to be presented as. And I think he definitely made some good points there. Um, again, I'm hoping hoping we see the return of Chris D'Elia soon. Brian Cannon, of course, we've got him on the Sam Trippi show, which is... Um, it looks it looks interesting for the most part i'm not just sure if he's entirely happy with what he's doing with sam Tripoli at the moment um if you see this clip that i'm going to play for you now at the moment i'm not too sure if brian cannon really um uh is that because <laughs> i guess the issue here is that 
if you're a fan of the fighting kid, you'll know that Brian Cannon has been for years trying to make it in Hollywood, right? Years. He's trying to be he tried to be an successful actor or comedic actor in some way, shape, or form. It hasn't necessarily worked out for him, even though he's probably one of the most funniest, naturally funniest people on the podcasting or in that LA community scene, right? In podcasts in general. He's just a naturally funny guy. Comes across really well, um, great timing, self-deprecations on point. Um, he knows how to carry on bits. He's great at improv. Just a really all-round strong, strong comedian. And I can only imagine people always say he's probably one of the best comedians within that circle live, right? He's someone you have to see live. You have to see live. Um, but he's obviously got that talent too. Oddly enough, well, he's actually a, quite a decent actor. Um, I guess it comes from his years in acting school and being classically trained or that sort of malarkey or being, you know, dabbling in that sort of stuff. But he's a, you know, serious dude. So he finally gets a shot at being in Hollywood. He finally gets a chance with his um, schooled and the gold, but you know, schooled as an offshoot, and I guess Goldberg was the main one, the main show he was doing. And he's suddenly there. He's there where he needs to be. And of course, the sexual allegations come out, and it kind of you know his whole world comes crashing down. And he tries to make a show with Brendan Shaw. That gets pulled by Cast Media, who says, "Nope, you cannot do that on our watch." So then he had to kind of justify the amount of money that was getting sent to him via Spotify via the fans and put out a show. Now, I don't think it's fair because I think part of the reason why they got that money from the fans via Patreon was because I think a lot of the fans love Brian and they love the show and they wanted to support him. So just a way for them to kind of like say, hey, hold your head up, right? We got your back. Um, I don't think it's going to be, I don't think they're going to be throwing fits at not having the show that they want that much. I think they're just going to be happy. Even if Brian started doing those videos that he did prior on his iPad and just uploading them on Patreon, people would be happy with it because I think he's just that, uh, he's that well liked within the T Fat K fan base, probably more so than Brendan Shaw. But if they do get a show, I'm not sure if the show they want is this, which is this conspiracy show they put together with Sam and Brian, which makes sense on paper because Sam Tripoli is all the way in on conspiracies and Brian Callen is all the way out, right? If you ever see the interactions that Brian Callen has with Eddie Bravo on Joe Rogan's show, you'll know that Brian Callen has no time for conspiracy theories. He thinks it's a complete waste of time. If anything, he thinks it's intellectually insulting. So for him to sit down with... Um, uh, <laughs> to sit down with Sam Tripoli with this clip of this show you see his face kind of like recoil when he starts to realize oh shit look what I've got myself into I'm gonna play I'm gonna play this clip for you now <laughs> now you gotta uh, you you have to look at this video dude now you gotta uh, no, uh, you, you uh, have to look at uh, let's go, let's go here let's go here from the start from the start Hanks getting his Greek <laughs> yeah kind of interesting right oh no and there's a Sam. picture with him and look at look at his expression too <laughs> kind of interesting dude Sam, take it away. What's going on with this? <laughs> well, you know, there's a guy he, that uh, uh, accused Tom Hanks of uh, being man. a pedophile. Uh, he was found dead under <laughs> the car. <laughs> Look at his face already. He's <laughs> ah! <laughs> to say across somebody he believes that Tom Hanks is a, a mastermind pedophile operator. Oh. <laughs> uh, in Arizona, and the weird thing was Tom Hanks look, had look his a message oh, on shit. the highway, either right bef a little before that or a little after that. And on the bottom, on on the um, Instagram post, there was a the guy who died. His name is Isaac Cappy, and on the Instagram post there was a cap, and he looked real good. It had a P on it. Now, <laughs> now that sounds crazy. You're like Sam. You're looking for uh, his last name was Cappy. He had a cap with a P on it. Okay, sounds crazy. So then we get to this thing, this thing called... Um, <laughs> Look at his face! <laughs> Again, man, how do I have fallen, man? I love Callum, but imagine having to go through this. And I love Sam Tripoli too. But imagine how, this is what your career has come down to, right? You had like a bit part role in The Joker. You were in it for like a... You're not even in it for a coffee. You were in it for a lollipop. Maybe a chewing gum, maybe a mint or two, right? And now suddenly you're, you're from being in a room with an accomplished actress, actor like um, Joaquin Phoenix is suddenly sitting alongside Sam Tripoli and he's trying to convince you that Tom Hanks is a nonce. Healthy <laughs> Buddha. Now you gotta, uh, you, you have to look at this video. Oh. And it breaks down this one Instagram post that Tom, look me in the eye, bro. You have to look at this video, look exactly. How are you talking about my, 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 my America's sweetheart, Tom Hanks? He's a Rothschild, but he listened. Oh, so yeah, here we go. Yeah, okay. And so is Ellen, by the way. She's either Rockefeller oh, or Rothschild. Fucking Rothschilds. It's his crazy. Look at look at so, Helen. Look at Tom Hanks is Jewish. That's the first time I've heard that. 
Well, I mean, like, there's different uh, brands. Uh, and uh, Rothschilds aren't you, so they're Kazarians. Anyway, so the whole point is this, is that uh, he had a picture. <laughs> he, was, uh, he takes these weird pictures where he, like, there looks like one thing. There's just one thing there, like a sock or a glove or a shoe, and it's the only thing there. So there's this one with a glove, and it lightly in what looks like water that's been vaporized. It's, I don't know how that, but it looks like it says S R E. USA, right? So this guy's known for doing research and he throws into Google, nothing comes up. But his whole thing is go through all the different search engines of all the different um, countries. But Russia has their own. So he throws it into the Russian search engine. Holy and shit. This, all this. this is deep. This is deep conspiracy theory waters, right? Where you're starting to believe that certain, ser which, which makes sense, isn't it? There are certain ser search engines, you know, you argue between Google and DuckDuckGo. That you know, throw up different results, but God Almighty, a Russian search engine to search for a picture of a glove? Insane shit comes up, man. Insane shit uh, that leads to really dark, dark stuff. Okay, so we got that. Then we have it on that he, on his Instagram. At one post, he had thirty thousand people shouting at him that he was a pedophile. Now, is that true? Yeah. I never heard this before. Yeah, the 30,000 people on his Instagram were commenting about, their, they were commenting his opinion. <laughs> he took off the comments on his fucking Jesus YouTube page. So, so then he put this weird, this weird picture up, right? If Have you heard of this? I've never heard of this before. 30,000 people, I, I don't know if this is true or not. I've never heard of it in my life. If you, can you go to his Instagram? Mm -hmm. where, are, where are the victims and why are they not speaking out? Oh, one has. Her name's Sarah Ashcroft. She said that that happened and no, nobody's listening. So go down. Go down. Uh, if you keep going, you just keep I going. I believe where there's one, there's many. You know what I'm saying? Okay, keep going. Oh, that's a risky thing to say, Callan. You know, with your allegations, if there's one, there's many. It's a risky thing to say. Risky thing to say. Keep going. I don't buy, I don't buy into... When if you yeah if you've done something oh okay I, he's he means like if you've done it once you, you'll do many so if he's been accused of one rape there should be other rapists coming up which isn't true I think there are rapists that do exist that you just do once and don't do it again still a horrible human being don't get me wrong and not accusing him of doing anything but to suggest that is really ridiculous anyway it's it's like saying oh because I robbed a Kinder Bueno I'm not gonna rob a Kit Kat it's like mm. Stress, you're a monster. probably a bad analogy, but you know what I mean. Monster, and, and there's a track see, see how all these things just no, no, not but just keep going because you're gonna find one of I mean, he might have taken it down. It's a what? boy, there it is. This one right here, yeah. Oh, I think I look for a glove. Okay, there's a boy, right? That boy, so so there's a video recently came out oh, of uh, this of uh, 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 that boy in a weird video, right? You remember that video where the the one guy's got the the fucking big. A uh, rainbow after look at look at Brian Gallen's face. <laughs> I think he realized at this moment this is a really bad idea, a really really bad idea. And the kid looks real. Because Sam Tripoli is probably, probably Sam Tripoli is probably the same level as Eddie Bravo, I think, in terms of conspiracy theory believers, right? He's not like he's maybe a bit more rational in terms of what he believes in some respects. I think he doesn't believe he believes that the moon landing wasn't fake. I think there's, there's something that they kind of diverge on, but they're on that same high frequency level where they just question everything, and Brian Callen just doesn't by any of it any of it whatsoever he's just not in that game whatsoever really uncomfortable and everyone's like look at him look at look at his fishing well they found out who this kid is you know who that kid is that is Leonardo Tom. DiCaprio. <laughs> that kid is tom <laughs> hanks co-star on bosom buddy's son okay and it was a weird so? video a very uncomfortable video that everybody saw so yeah. that, then he runs to Greece. I I'm telling you, dude, there's Why like 90 Greek citizenship. Because in Greece, uh, pedophilia is a uh, mental illness, not a crime. What? Okay, but. Okay, that silence says it all. And I don't know, man. I don't know. What would you say if you're Brian Cannon and this is your career? Is this a, is this a success to you? Is this a failure? And again, the issue, again, I'll, I'll link it to you and play the rest of it because I think it's about a minute left. I'm not going to bore you with the rest of it. But. I guess the issue for a canon is that you like he could have easily been one of the biggest podcasters and comedy guys on the scene, right? Cause, but you know, just for his maybe lack of work ethic and maybe wanting to make it in Hollywood more, so it didn't really happen. And you know, without Br Brendan, he probably wouldn't have had position he's into now, right? Brendan kind of was the business brains behind it and kind of gave him a platform and T Fat K. They have great chemistry and boom, big success. But he's always had his eye on Hollywood. 
And if anything, it's come to bite him in the, bat, in the bum because now he's been accused of what he's been accused of. Hollywood has probably put the kaputs on everything he's doing, even outside of Hollywood. He has to do a show behind a paywall. He can't even do a show on bloody normal YouTube anymore because it doesn't make any economic sense, I guess. He doesn't want to risk having a show with low followers and all that kind of... He wants to be on the same platform that he was before, blah, 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 blah. So it's really goes to show that you should maybe double down on the things that actually pay you on the places that you're actually getting the love and the appreciation that you need and not the places that are always constantly disregarding you, asking you to audition a million times, questioning your artistry, um, wanting to repackage you another way, making you get your fucking lids done. Because for real, believe, the lids that he got done was made was mostly a Hollywood thing. I'm sure of it. He wanted to be cast in certain roles. He's obviously always self-conscious about the hair, flicking it up and doing that weird thing that he was doing, taking Propecia, right? He was obviously conscious about trying to make it, even when the doors were firmly closed in his face. And if he just would have focused on just the podcasting thing and doing his thing independently, he would have been in a far better platform and a far better position to capitalize on it once Hollywood decided to cancel him. Unfortunately, I think. Um, Again, I guess support the show if you want. It's on the Fire in the Ring, so I'm sure they're going to put more out. Uh, Brian mentioned he's going to do another show called The Callan Report, maybe similar to what Dave Rubin does with The Rubin Report. I'm not too sure, but let me know in the comments down below, man. What do you think? Is it like a bad? Is it like a bad image for Callan going forward? Um, is it a good thing that he's doing something regardless? Uh, do you think? Do you think he wants to hang himself now? He's working with Sam Tripoli. Uh, is Sam Tripoli right? Is is um, Tom Hanks um, a questionable figure? Should we be worried about him? Um, let me know in the comments down below. Oh, anyway. That's actually the Zinger Show, man. It's actually been my longest one so far. Two hours. So I'm going to leave. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you listening to what I've had to say. As per usual, if you want to support the show, make sure you smash the like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you listen via the podcast app, leave, please download the show and share it with all your friends. Leave me a five-star review. And if you want to support the show via Patreon, please do via the link down below, patreon.com forward slash Agostino. That's patreon.com forward slash A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O. And you can hear this entire show in full HD before everybody Everybody else hears it on any other platform it'll be exclusively launched on um patreon first and then released everywhere else so definitely check it out on patreon.com for just like you know for as little as one dollar a month you can support this show go on there and log in and log on until then see you guys very soon take care peace